Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, we proudly bring to you Mormonism Live! Shut up and sit down. Captain America, are you ready to uh, to assemble the Avengers? Uh, well, sure. I'm always ready to assemble the Avengers, but technically, <laughs> we're talking Doctor Strange. Do- oh, I thought it was. I thought the I saw the top of the cape, and I thought it was a Captain America shield, but it is Doctor Strange. Yes. By the way, have you seen the new Spider Man yet? I just saw it this weekend. Okay, I'm I'm gonna ruin it for everybody. If you haven't seen it, this <laughs> is the moment you want to mute it for for everyone for just a second. But that some of that plot in the beginning doesn't make any sense to me. Well, it makes in terms sense of to me. Well, in terms of Peter Parker, yeah, um, hijacking Doctor Strange's plan when you really should trust Doctor Strange as the expert, right? Yeah, I'm sorry, but uh, Peter Parker has a higher moral ethos than Doctor Strange. Yeah, okay, all right. Doctor Strange with that. is burdened with protecting the entire planet from cosmic forces. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, then I'll. I got gotcha. you. Then we'll we'll stick with the movie. Was just great. It was a good movie. It was highly rated by Rotten Tomatoes. I just, I'm big into plot holes. If you know what I mean. Like. <laughs> yes, and without. <laughs> so I hope I filled that one in for you. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I want to make quick note that uh, on each of our websites, at least most of them, I think there's one or two I still need to add it to, but most of our websites with different podcasts, we now have a gift shop up and running. We, you and I have been talking a little bit this week. We've uh, let all the other podcast hosts know that there's a gift shop up there. Um, We would really welcome ideas. If anybody has an idea for a a Mormonism Live t-shirt, a marriage on a tightrope coffee mug, um, a radio free Mormon hoodie, we've put up some really cool ones. There's one that says Mormonism's real profits, and it's got a picture of you and me on the back of it. Um, really, so that, I don't even that, know about this. Have I this, have I authorized the usage of my my image? <laughs> on this we are tied at the hip, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope so, it's a good picture. By the way, yeah. if there's going to be a coffee mug for marriage on a tight rope, it should be one of those half mugs. The half mugs, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and maybe when you put like hot liquid in it, it changes color or something, or or the message changes or something. Like the church is true, and then it isn't, and like whatever you know. That way, you yes. both win. Exactly. There you go. So check it out. If you go to mormondiscussions.org, mormondiscussionpodcast.org, radiofreemormon.org, marriageonatightrope.org, uh, and any of the other ones, I, I think you'll find generally, I think there's one or two that isn't, but generally you'll find the gift shop up there, tons of good merchandise. And uh, I uh, ran it by the accountant, by the way. We're a tax-exempt nonprofit. And whatever portion of the entity does taxable work, we just report that and pay taxes on it. So um, we are off and running on the 2021 tax filing. You identified um, us as two true prophets, Bill. Two true prophet. We have way more predictions that have come true, and we are much better truth tellers than those who are honest as they know how to be. Okay. Well, it kind of makes me concerned because there's only one place in all the standard works that I'm aware of two prophets being mentioned, and it's in the book of Revelation. If if we define prophet the way the Old Testament does, which is those who push back against the system and raise a banner of truth, trying to get people to be healthier inside the system, we're nailing it, my friend. Okay. All I can say is I'm not going to go on a pleasure cruise with you to Jerusalem okay. anytime we're, soon. And is it two bodies or three that lay in the street for three days? Zwei, two. mein lieber Freund. Zwei. We will never go to Jerusalem together, my friend. Never. <laughs> All right, so tonight, I think tonight's going to be a blast. We have all been working behind the scenes uh, quite a bit to put this together, and I want to give a big shout-out to Maven, who is really going to uh, help us highlight this episode. This episode may go a little long uh, because there is a lot to cover, and in fact, there's so much to cover that uh, that we can't get to all of it. Uh, correct, RFM? That is correct, sir. Yeah, yeah. So I'm going to add— Oh, uh, this is my announcement. 
Oh, please give your announcement and then I'll leave this image up so people are getting teased and tell us about your coming up trip uh, to St. George. To St. George, your neck of the woods. I'll be there this Sunday presenting at 2 o'clock p.m. at the Hilton Garden Inn in beautiful downtown. I don't know if it's downtown, but in beautiful (laughs) St. George. I have no idea where it is. So hopefully I'll be able to find it there in advance of, you know, 2 o'clock p.m. And I've got my subject. Still got lots of work to do on it. It's a story that I have been dying to tell for years. Never had the correct, um, what do you call it, platform. And uh, I hope everybody will find it as exciting as I do. It's a story that's never been told. Nobody else could ever tell the story because it happened to me. And it spans 25 years. I'll compress it down to an hour, leave time for Q&A afterward. However, some people have asked, are there tickets? No, there's no tickets. Is there any admission fee? No, there's no admission fee. Donations will be uh, asked for. I don't know if they actually pass a plate. But it's all voluntary. If you want to donate, the donations there would be going to the South Utah um, Post Mormon um, uh, Support Group, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a very long, long title, and it doesn't have a snappy acronym. Yeah, but it's full of good people. Yeah, and Wayne, Wayne Hepworth. Hepworth. Yeah, he is fantastic. He's the head of this group, and he's the one who organizes these things, and probably a lot more. So I wanted to give him a shout out as well. Yeah, he might be the biggest mover and shaker of all things post-Mormon in Southern Utah, and we deeply appreciate him and all he does. I've had the chance to rub shoulders with him on several occasions, and I've got nothing but good things to say about Wayne Hepworth and the work he does down here. Um, So, yep, absolutely. Um, By the way, you're right, no admissions. So no 10% fee, no time, talents, and gifts given to building up the kingdom of God. Just show up and uh, enjoy RFM's conversation. Oh, it's going to be a blast. I hope, I hope, I hope. I'm always worried that I'm going to let people down, but I think it's going to be great. Good. Well, yeah, I don't think you're going to let people down. I think everybody's always excited to see uh, RFM broadcasting behind enemy lines. It's going to be a lot of fun. But by the way, we got to get to tonight's show. We because do. Because this is so exciting. The story you've, you've broadcasted is the Two Camorras. Is that the name of it? I, I apologize. That's okay. It's the Two Hills Camorra Theory. I, I debated between the Two Hill Camorras in yeah. the Two Hills Camorra, and I went with the one that sounded a little weirder because we used to argue all the time in church whether it was Books of Mormon, Book of Mormons, or copies, copies of the of Book, the of, Book of Mormon. Of Mormon. Yeah, see, <laughs> there's always this uh, this debate that goes on. Yes, we um, want to say it right, by yeah, which I yeah. mean correctly. Sorry, Mom. Okay, Maven, you RFM. got something for us? Yeah, yes. they're asking in the chat if you're going to be recording the, the talk that you're giving in St. George. I think that it is going to be recorded. I think they make a practice of recording mm-hmm. it and then they share the audio with me and then we put it up um, at Radio Free Mormon, probably also at Mormon Discussion. So it will be available for those who can't be there. Yep, love it. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. just let me know when that happens in terms of you getting the audio and where I can get it from you and I'll put it up on uh, a couple of the websites as well as yours. Okay, so we get to talk about why are there two hills Camorra? Let's do it. So let's start. I want to I want to start with the idea of uh, what the scriptures tell us about Camorra. And some of it's a little damning, if I can be honest. Okay, I've, got my, uh, so, I've got my triple com right here, Bill. I'm ready to go. The, the text might be a little difficult to read, but if you turn your YouTube on to full screen, you obviously won't be able to comment during those moments, but you should be able to read everything on the screen. I can read the smaller version on mine, although very small. Um, But you'll be able to read it on yours much easier. And we're going to start with Mormon uh, 6-4. And in Mormon 6-4, it says, We did pitch our tents round about the hill Camorra, and it was in the land of many waters, rivers, and fountains. And I just want to note here, when you look at Palmyra, New York, which is going to be on the right-hand side of the screen, the lower third, just below, I think that's Lake Ontario, Just below that, you're going to have where you see the word New York, and just to the left of it is the Finger Lakes. Camorra is just above those. And if you understand that Joseph Smith, if you you assume, as I'm going to at the beginning of this episode, that the Book of Mormon is made up fan fiction of the Bible, then um, the Palmyra area makes very good sense in light of this scripture, that it is the land of many waters, Uh, rivers and fountains. Niagara Falls is close by. You've got all the Great Lakes. You've got all those Finger Lakes. And if you want to go to your own Google Maps and zoom in, you have tons of rivers, right? RFM, if if you were going to describe the Book of Mormon as a place of tons of waterways, this area is as good as any on the planet. 
Well, actually, yeah, that's totally true. I mean, you've got these huge Great Lakes, which I've never visited, but I understand they're massive. You used to live right by them in Ohio, oh, didn't you? It's like a little ocean, man. You you can get out in the middle and you see nothing and you can ride your boat for an hour or so and not see land anywhere. Yeah, and there was a certain wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald. That's about the only thing I know about the Great Lakes, and that was on yeah. Superior. Good old Gordon Lightfoot. That's how I know, because of the lyrics, right? <laughs> By the way, what was that part that you read again from Mormon, the Book Mormon of Mormon, in the Book six, of Mormon? Mormon 6, verse 4. We did pitch four. our tents round about the hill Cumorah, and it was in the land of many waters, rivers, and fountains. Am I the only person who thinks of the old Ham's commercial, the Ham's beer commercial? Every time I read this, even as a TBM, I would think about that. Do you know the commercial I'm talking about? <laughs> I don't know anything. I mean, I don't know anything about this ham commercial. Well, it has this cartoon bear on it, and it says, from the land of sky blue waters. Um, no, I've never heard that. This is this is before my time, maybe. I think so. Okay, okay. but <laughs> I hope somebody else out there has heard it. Let us know in the live chat if you have. Please. Uh, okay, so there's now, lots of waters. Yep. It's, more, it's Mormon chapter 6, and we're going yep. from the text of the Book of Mormon and looking at how well... Uh, the hill Cumorah from which Joseph Smith retrieved the plates matches this geographical description. Yeah. And there's three other scriptural references I want to hit on. They each, you know, hit on a different point. So we're going to kind of step away from the fact that this Palmyra geography seems to fit extremely well. If you turn to Mormon 6.6, 6, it says that Mormon hit up the records in the hill Cumorah with the exception of of the small set of plates that were left to Moroni that would later make up the Book of Mormon. So I think this is a the spot book of where... Moroni or the Book of Ether? You said which would later make up the Book of Mormon. You oh, the, the thing? small plates that Moroni took with him was the Book of Mormon we have today, plus the 116 pages of Lehi. And then all the other records, which were condensed down to the small plates, were put into the Hill Cumorah by Mormon. And then the leftover plates, which would make up the 116 pages plus the Book of Mormon, were given to Moroni to take with him. Okay, and I don't want to get distracted from your main point, but I don't know if I'm the only one who finds the description of the little plates and the big plates and these plates and those plates somewhat needlessly confusing. It is. Uh, it does seem to obfuscate things, doesn't it? <laughs> yes, but go ahead. That's not the main point. <laughs> okay. It, the main point on this scripture is I want to, um, I want to agree with the apologist. Let me grab something. Hang on, stop the presses. Bill no, Reynolds no, no. is so, about to agree with the apologists. I do, yeah. And so people say sometimes that, you know, we can never get the apologist to sit down and, and acknowledge things with us, but I'm going to do it here. They're right in that the Hill Cumorah, as articulated in the Book of Mormon, is all we know about that hill in the Book of Mormon is that that's where all the plates were stored except for the Book of Mormon. And the Book of Mormon was given to Moroni in a different small set of plates. He took those with him. And so where he buried those plates, the Book of Mormon doesn't tell us. It ends, the book ends with him, you know, traveling around, trying to avoid the Lamanites. He's the last of his kind. And where he ends up and what he does, we simply don't know. And so it's not impossible that Moroni... Uh, might start at one location and end up at a second, as we'll talk about tonight, though highly unlikely. But I want to grant that the Book of Mormon at least leaves some space that maybe for other reasons it's irrational, but at least on the text of the Book of Mormon, we are not forced to believe that Moroni buried the plates at the same place his father buried the majority of the plates that the records were condensed from. Until 1823, if... My recollection of church history serves. Uh, 1823. What? Uh, well, when Moroni shows up. So let let me get through a few more here, and then you can pipe in at any moment with uh, what you're what you're insinuating. Um, the next one is Ether 1511. Okay, hang on just a second. And, um, okay, 1511. Go ahead. Let me just. Uh, by the way, that's the hill. There, there's all of Mormon's records. By the way, on the screen, that was the Mormon six six. Those are all the records buried. Um, we have an idea of what this um, might have looked like because we have lots of quotes we'll point to later on where people in at least visionary state and maybe in a literal going into a hill saw all these plates. Um, the next one's Ether 1511. And what this one tells us is the Jaredites, uh, their hill Rama and the Nephite hill Camora are the same hill. Um, because of that scripture, 1511. 
Uh, he is this saw... the one that's up here? And it came to pass that the army of Coriantumr did pitch their tents by the hill Rama. Oh, and it was that same hill where my father Mormon did hide up the records unto the Lord, which were sacred. Got it. Yeah. Um, it also is noted in the same section. Uh, he saw that there had been slain by the sword already two millions of his people. And he began to sorrow in his heart. Yea, there had been slain two millions of mighty men and also their wives and right, their and children. That's... And that's Ether chapter 15, verse 2. Yep. So you got 2 million, almost 2 million uh, mighty men who are who are killed, plus, apparently, their wives and their kids. Yeah. Which would increase and, it by at least a factor of two, one would think. And probably yeah, more. I think that's conservative. But, you know, these are, these are uh, earlier Mormons, right? Like, these are, like, we're, they're encouraged to multiply and replenish the earth, too. Well, absolutely. <laughs> the earth must be peopled. Yeah. The The only thing I can, I, I want to say here in addition is if you notice what a battle of millions would look like, can you imagine RFM how difficult it would be to keep a military force this big supplied with food, waste management, um, being able to care for everybody, how we would come up with sleeping quarters every day as they moved. Like it would probably be pretty difficult, wouldn't it? Yeah, I think it would be very, very difficult, mainly because uh, millions of people are going to pretty much deforest or depopulate as far as wildlife or anything that they could kill for food. Yeah. Uh, very quickly. They'd be About like a, a day, bunch of right? locusts. I mean, yeah, like... they'd be like locusts coming through. <laughs> so they'd yeah. have to bring their own, which means, I mean, how many millions of livestock do you have to have and provisions and everything? But I guess that's why their wives were there. Maybe they were doing all the work during the day of, of gathering. Yeah, they're out uh, fighting in the wife's home, cooking the dinner, making the donuts for when the men come home at night from the priesthood session. Yeah, imagine in primitive times trying to supply those people with food and supplies and managing all those. I, I, I bet if we were to contact the U.S. government and ask them what's all involved in a giant military force moving from one place to another, I bet they'd say there's not only a lot of planning, but there's a lot of technology used that probably couldn't have happened in an earlier time, if you know what I mean. It does seem to be. Well, let's just put it this way. This is a much larger number than any other battle, I think, in human history. Yes. <laughs> and that probably, I don't know, does that include World War II? Yeah. <laughs> and and let's note, too, I mean, you were pointing this out before we started the show. It's not just the, the uh, Jaredite battles, but there's also not as many, but there's a significant number lost in the Nephite battles, too, on the same hill. Yes, and that's, of course, substantially later. It's probably about, I don't know, uh, a thousand years later, give or take. But um, there's uh, 230,000 Nephites who were killed on the same hill in their final battle. You have to do a little bit. That's also in Mor uh, Mormon chapter 6, by the way. I think it's verses 11 through 14 or so. You have to add them up. But when you add them up, you get to 230,000. So nowhere near as many as 2 million men plus their wives and children but still a substantial number. By the way, the thing that you were referring to earlier about supplying the army and all this other stuff, that is, I believe, called logistics. Yeah, logistics. In military um, terminology. It's the overall process of managing how resources are acquired, stored, and transported to their final destination. Because you yeah. don't just have to have the army, right? You got to have the food. You got to have the supplies. You got to have the armor. I mean, they got to at least arm these people unless they're going to be out there. I don't know, doing Kung Fu. Apparently yeah. they would have some kind of, uh, some kind of weaponry because, uh, an army travels on its stomach as the saying goes. And, um, whatever supplies they have in a battle where that many people die, there should be a few articles left behind, right? Yeah. This is one of the main problems. Uh, and I think that's where you're going right now with this Hill Camorra in Western New York. Uh, being the location as described in the Book of Mormon, one of there, there are several problems with it, and some of them seem to be pretty much insurmountable. And the bottom line is, first off, you got this problem with numbers. I mean, how are you going to fit all those people in there just to fight in the first place? The second is they would leave scads of archaeological artifacts. There would be bones. There would be uh, weapons. There would be uh, remnants of it. In other words, you cannot possibly believe that a battle of this magnitude took place here with these people being killed and have no 
artifacts that are found by archaeologists. In other words, we've got places all over the world from even much older than this where they're finding relics of people and the fact that they're not here, the only possible explanation is that Satan came and whisked them away at night when nobody was looking in order to increase our faith. With with God, all things are possible. Yes. <laughs> okay. And then the last place in the scriptures is uh, D&C uh, 128, verse 20. And this is, this is uh, you know, this is revelation in the Doctrine and Covenants. And it says, and again, what do we hear? Glad tidings from Camorra, Moroni, an angel from heaven, declaring the fulfillment of the prophets, uh, the book to be revealed. And we should note, again, that language is a little ambiguous. It could be Joseph Smith or Sidney Rigdon or whoever is having the conversation implementing that sort of language and calling it Camorra and not necessarily ancient prophets, correct? Well, I think the thing about this particular passage is there's two things we want to focus on. I believe that everybody, apologists and non-apologists, I'll say the farms crew, because they're invested in the Mesoamerican model, that the Camorra is down there, not to get too far ahead. But then there's the Meldrumites, the heartland theorists, who say, no, Camorra is Camorra is Camorra, and this is where everything happened, just like the Book of Mormon said, just like church leaders have said for over 100 years, once again, not trying to get ahead yeah. of us. But So they would both agree that this hill is where Joseph Smith got the plates. Yeah. The issue and, is whether this hill is the same Camorra where all those battles took place. Yeah. And, and as we pointed out, at least in this section of the DNC, we don't have it explicitly saying that it's in the voice of God. Rather, it might be context given by Joseph Smith or someone else who's articulating the language. But then we run into the very next problem, which... Um, is the history of the church one uh, one eighty four? And so it's volume one. I want to make sure I get this right. It is volume one, and I want to go all the way up to the top here. While you're looking at that, I'll just add that chapter one twenty eight is are the words of Joseph Smith. He was writing a letter about baptism for the dead in eighteen forty two. He was yeah. probably in hiding at the time, which is why he was writing a letter. Yeah, tell me, tell me whose uh, voice this one's in. So this is History of the Church, Volume 1, Chapter 15. Notice this. This book, which contained these things, was hid in the earth by Moroni in a hill called by him Camorra, which hill is now in the state of New York near the village of Palmyra in Ontario County. Huh. Who could the him be, RFM? Well, it's Moroni, obviously. <laughs> I mean, Joseph Smith didn't just make up this name out of thin air. He had to get it from somebody, and Moroni is the one who told him, hey, this is where the plates are, and by the way, the name of this hill is Kumora. Yeah, huh. So if we're to believe, as we get into a two-hill theory, we would have to believe that Moroni decided to call both hills Kumora. Well, you know, you make a point there that I wasn't expecting. Because what <laughs> I was going to say, and a very clever point too, by the way, I want to give you credit for that. Uh, I was about to say, yeah, this says that the plates came from the Hill Camorra, the one in Western New York by Joseph Smith's home, not far from it. Um, but it doesn't say that the battles occurred there, right? No. So you would think everybody could agree on it, but you raise a very interesting point. Did Moroni call both hills Camorra? Because obviously he's calling the one in Western New York Camorra, as yeah. related in this passage from the history of the church. Yeah, it's just a little more conjecture, just an extra allowance we just need to make to see if we can make all this fit. So there's that one. Um, next up is the 1835 Messenger and Advocate. Um, it says... Church uh, newspaper. Is, yeah, yeah. This is page four. And uh, this is Oliver Cowdery. Uh, he is writing this article for the 1835 Messenger and Advocate, page four. Um, but do you know who the editor of the Messenger and Advocate at this time is? I think it's W.W. W. Phelps. It's not. It's Joseph Smith. Oh, it was really? It was Joseph Smith. Um, and so Joseph Smith, uh, as the editor, and then Oliver Cowdery writing, they declare, because again, it would get approval by Joseph Smith if he's the lead editor. Um, Oliver Cowdery declares Camorra is the hill in New York in that article. Maven's got it up there on the screen. Uh, you can, you know, print... Uh, Save the screen there, I guess, because print screen, I guess, is the button I push on my computer. You can save that image and use it later. 
all of the links here, all the documents, all the URL links for the stuff we prepared for this episode will be in the resource notes uh, on the published audio and the YouTube version uh, tonight and tomorrow morning. Uh, so you can find that there as well and read it for yourself. But Oliver Cowdery declares that the hill in New York is uh, the hill Camorra. Next and up. See, can I see that again? I'm so sorry. No, it's right there. It's on up. the screen. La yeah, the, the Messenger and Advocate was a newspaper in Kirtland, Ohio from 1834 to 1837. So let me just see here. You've got it Please. up there. Let me find it. Where are you? Oh, here you are. Uh, can can I see that? Uh, can we blow that up a little bit? Yeah, let me try to do that. I'm going to grab um, a different screen. I apologize screen. for this because this is know. an extremely significant article. And the Heartland theorists, the Meldrumites, as they're sometimes called, and I don't mean any disrespect by calling them that, but uh, those who maintain that Camorra in New York is Camorra for the battles and for the plates, just like uh, the prophets have taught over the course of 100 years, this becomes a very important document that they use to support their position. I think this is one of the letters that Oliver Cowdery wrote very early on in which he starts setting forth the history of the church. Uh, there are a series of letters that he writes. This one is from, I believe, letter number seven. And uh, I have seen pictures of uh, followers of Rodney Meldrum or Heartland theorists uh, with a red ball cap with the words embroidered on the front in big letters, letter seven, V-I-I -I in Roman numerals. So that's how important this is to them. Yeah, and I hope that this deal. is letter seven. I think it is. So where do we have there about... Uh, so if you start right there at the you are acquainted. Okay, can I, you want me to read? Please. Okay, thank you. You are acquainted with the mail road from Palmyra, Wayne County. That's mail road for those listening to the audio. Mail road from Palmyra, Wayne County to Canandaigua, uh, Ontario County, New York. And also as you pass from the former to the latter place before arriving at the little village of Manchester. Boy, look at all the details we have. Say from three to four or about four miles from Palmyra, you pass a large hill. Here we go. You pass a large hill on the east side of the road. I wonder what hill that is. Why I say large is because it is as large, perhaps, as any in that country. In other words, it's not that big, just relatively. I live up here in the foothills of the Cascades. This is not large by my standards, at least. To a person acquainted with the road, uh, this road, a description would be unnecessary as it is the largest and rises the highest of any on that route. The north end rises quite sudden. Man, are we going to get, let's see, as you pass by, I think I'm justified in saying, uh, yeah, I don't see anything in here. All right, you can skip down. Let's skip down. So, yeah, we're getting this geography description. Okay, read that last part ah, then. Thank you. By turning to the 529th and 530th pages of the Book of Mormon, this would, of course, be in the first edition. So it's not going to be on those same pages now. In fact, you'll probably run out of pages before you get that high now. Or they you could be just cut out and missing. Oh, it's because of the way, oh, never mind. By turning to the, uh, the Book of Mormon, you will, you will read Mormon's account of the last great struggle of his people. That's Mormon chapter six. Um, as they were encamped around this hill, Camorra. Okay, so he is, what? Oh, this sounds very definite. This it is, sounds like yeah. he's gone to great lengths to describe and pinpoint this hill, Camorra, in Western New York and give the total description of it, talk about how large it is, and now saying, you will read Mormon's account of the last great struggle of his people as they were encamped round this hill, Camorra. Well, that sounds pretty definite as far as a statement goes. I can see why the Heartlanders uh, promote this passage. Look even further. In this valley fell the remaining strength and pride of a once powerful people, the Nephites. And if we go once, back up, so once highly, highly favored, favored of the Lord. Does it say anything yeah. about the Jaredites here or just the Nephites? Just, I think just the Nephites. But okay, so we know hill. the Nephites, and we know the Book of Mormon says, same place, same hill as yeah. the Jaredites with their two million men and their wives and their wives and their children. Yeah. Well, that sounds very definitive. I'm actually seeing why they have gone to making red ball caps with that embroidered on the That's track. a big one for them. The, uh, the next one is History of the Church, 1948 edition is what I'm using, volume two. Excuse, Excuse me. me, is that Moroni yep. in that picture? Does this have a shovel? is a, by the way, uh, by the way, I'll just say this. The church has some gorgeous images of Joseph Smith on the hill and Moroni on the hill and a lot of interaction with Moroni in the plates and Joseph Smith in the plates. 
Um, they did some kind of modern reenactment, took a ton of photos. And on the church site, it said, uh, you're free to use these. They want you to share them, download them, show them to people. So we're just using a fair use here and and we're, taking them up on that offer. We're sharing. Yeah, this we're taking like them up on that offer. Because I think it, yeah, it helps us all kind of connect the dots. I think these images are crucial to seeing what uh, this might have looked like. So, um, Bill, nine, Bill, yes, please. what is your learning school today? Uh, I didn't go to school today. You tell me. Sharing is caring. Sorry, that's an old Cracker Jack commercial. <laughs> okay. Did you yeah, get a free we're toy? We're sharing. We're sharing. That's all we're do, doing. We're sharing like they asked us to. Do they still give a free toy with those? Absolutely. Yeah. I used to get them at baseball games. I'd go to the Cleveland Indians game, and my mom would buy me a box of Cracker Jacks, and there'd be the prize inside. And it was never anything super exciting, but you were so excited to get it, weren't you? Absolutely. I love Cracker Jack. Yeah, good, good. Um, all right. So, uh, 1940 edition of the History of the Church, Volume 2, pages oh, 79. By the way, by the way yeah. that, that Messenger and Advocate article, that letter by Oliver Cowdery, Please. That, was, that was 1835, correct? That that was that published. That was um, 1835, Messenger and Advocate, yes. Okay, because that date is very important. It's a very early statement by Oliver Cowdery, who did hang out a little bit with Joseph Smith at the time. I mean, he was the second elder in the church for a period of time. Yeah. And so now I want to put up on the screen this 1948. This is where Zelf was found, RFM. And uh, you can see there on the top of the mound were stones. It talks about them finding this bone and then they find the skeleton. And it says here, his name was Zelf. He was a warrior and a chieftain under the great prophet Onondangus, who was known from the Hill Camorra or Eastern Sea to the Rocky Mountains. In other words, they're putting it on a parallel ge in, ge in geography and saying, here's the Rocky Mountains and here's the Hill Camorra. And between those two, all these events happened. Um, the curse was taken from Zelf or at least in part and goes on to talk about his bones. But it is a recognition that that Joseph Smith, who wrote that, that Joseph well, is being quoted here. Yeah. Well, we don't know what Brigham Young and and the B.H. Roberts did later, but um, at least here, the credit would be given to Joseph Smith, who's claiming that it is from the Hill Camorra to the Rocky Mountains that all of this stuff took place. Right. And all I meant by that comment was that obviously people are writing down what Joseph Smith said. He didn't yeah. write it down in his own handwriting, but they would be, um, of course, um, motivated to try and capture his words as accurately as they possibly could. Yeah. So from the Hill Camorra or the Sea East, i.e. the Eastern Seaboard, what yeah. we would call it now, right? Mm -hmm. To the to the Rocky Mountains. This this was a very famous guy, this uh this Zell fellow. Yeah, yeah. He was known all over the place, and so was his commander, Onan Dangus. Yeah, which sounds very much like one of the nations of the Iroquois. Yeah, yeah. Seven tribes there. Yeah, I'm sure it's related. Okay, but <laughs> I like to think, Bill, by the way, here's here's my compliment for you tonight. Yes. Uh I like to think that you Bill Real are actually probably known from the Eastern Sea to the Rocky Mountains by this point. Yeah, yeah. Maybe I'm maybe I'm just as popular as Onondagas. Maybe beyond. Maybe, <laughs> maybe to Australia and I don't know, England. Scooping? There probably there probably are more Mormons who know the name Bill Real and Radio Free Mormon than know Onondagas. I mean, I don't think most Mormons are really reading their Book of Mormon, are they? I don't know. I did an awful lot. You and me both, brother. Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, this so is that, a fun so, there, so there's once again another document that you presented that indicates strongly that the Hill Camorra in Western New York is where everything happened, including the battles. Oh, yeah. We're not done yet, my friend. Well, there's more. Okay. <laughs> there's more. So this is an interesting event in church history. Uh, this is an event, I believe, recorded by David Whitmer, um, where David Whitmer, Oliver Cowdery, and Joseph Smith all claim that they are visited, and, and Whitmer is the voice for this, that they're all visited by Moroni. And so you have uh, that there. I, I don't, I can't necessarily read it, but they essentially, Joseph Smith's on the back of a wagon, Whitmer and Cowdery on the front. Some guy comes up and uh, they're like, uh, who are you and wh what's going on? And he goes, oh, I've got to get going. I'm on my way to Camorra. And uh, Joseph Smith apparently tells them that that was Moroni they just saw. <laughs> And uh, this so is one anyway. of my favorite stories. Can we enlarge that a bit? And can we ask Maven to read it? Because I just love hearing her voice. Yeah, Maven, if you have it there, jump on. Uh, otherwise, give me a second. I'm going to bring it at least up so that people can see that. 
Um, that is number four. So this looks, looks like part of an interview that's being conducted with David Whitmer. And he's the DW that we see next to the margin where he's being quoted in this. Let's see if I can. What what page was that? Um, looks like 772. Yeah, there she is. Hi, Maven. I'm Seven, here. Seven, yes. But when I when I put the slides together, they're they're tough to um, mess around with. But I am so I'm just trying to get it where I can see it. One second. So right here, um, I've got it up on the screen uh, now. And if you look on the right hand side, um, about a third of the way down, it says, "When I was returning to Fayette." Do you see okay. that? Maybe? Um. I can make it a little bigger too. No, I, I found it. I, I, I just got the weird feeling of being in Sunday school and being asked to uh -huh. take a turn to read. <laughs> um, okay. You'll have to fight it for me again. Um, yeah, okay. when, right, right there. there. When I was okay. right at the top. Yeah. When I was returning to Fayette with Joseph and Oliver, all of us riding in the wagon, Oliver and I on an old fashioned wooden spring seat and Joseph behind us while traveling along in a clear open place, a very pleasant, nice looking old man suddenly appeared by the side of our wagon and saluted us with good morning. It is very warm <laughs> at the same time, wiping his face or forehead with his hand. We returned the salutation, and by a sign from Joseph, I invited him to ride if he was going our way. But he said very pleasantly, no, I am going to Kimura. This name was something new to me. I did oh, not know on, what... Oh, oh did I miss... On. He Note that he said, notice that David Whitmer hears the word Kimura, and he doesn't recognize the word. Hmm. He says it is a new word to him. He goes, so Moroni says, no, I am going to Kimura. And Whitmer says, this name was something new to me. Please continue. I did not know what Kimura meant. We all gazed at him and at each other. And as I looked around inquiringly of Joseph, the old man instantly disappeared so that I did not see him again. And there it is. There it is. Uh, interesting stuff. So there is a artist depiction of that event happening uh, in the document right next to it. But it, it seems RFM as if Moroni once again... Uh, paints us all into a corner and either we have to buy into that Moroni decided to name a little tiny drumlin in Palmyra, New York after the same hill that was so uh, stood out so much in his culture just years earlier where major battles took place and it was such a prominent hill and, and named them both Kimura. Yes, one starts to get the idea that something is afoot. <laughs> something here. Uh, yeah, it might be the whole body. <laughs> I mean, if, look, if you've made the trek from all the way from freaking Mesoamerica and you have a little hill where you're going to bury the plates because in what, 1400 years, it's going to be where Joseph Smith's family is going to move to, which is, of course, all part of the divine design, right? It's got to get there somehow. I mean, wouldn't the first thing that you would do is name the hill after the place where your entire civilization was wiped out? Yeah, that that's... That's possible. Just a I mean, little more conjecture, but it's possible. You know, just for memory's sake. Yeah. As you're taking your last breath and throwing those plates in the ground after you've already lost 20 pounds from traveling all the way out to Manta, Utah first. And how is, who is he telling, who is, who's Moroni telling that this is, this hill is Kimura? David Whitmer, who's on the wagon with Oliver Cowdery and Joseph Smith. I'm sorry. I'm talking about 421 CE. Oh. When he's burying the plates. He's all by himself. There's no need to call this hill anything because you can't describe it to anybody else because he's the only one left and he's dodging Lamanites right and left. Yeah. Don't you think it's strange in those last few minutes of, of deciding to hold onto the plates and digging a hole and putting a stone box in and putting the plates inside that you'd etch a few last words and say, here I am bearing those plates. Yeah. Or something like drums, drums in the deep. <laughs> I don't know what that's a reference to, but. Okay. Live chat. Let's hear it. <laughs> All right, next. Now we get into <laughs> we get into some more modern conversation. Okay. And uh, we end up here. That's uh, the other quote there that she just read. Hmm. We end up here with Mark E. Peterson. This is out of a book uh, called A Work of Convert a Work of Conversion. And it says General Conference Address in Messages of Inspiration, Salt Lake City, Deseret Book Company, 1957, hmm. page 98 to 106. He says, at least in part of that, he says, I do not believe that we should give credence to the highly speculative theories about Book of Mormon geography. I do not believe 
that there were two Hill Camoras, one in Central America and the other one up in New York. Okay. For the convenience of the prophet Joseph Smith, so that the poor boy would not have to walk clear to Central America to get those gold plates. That's a long walk. Now, wait a second here. Because what I've heard the theory is, is that Moroni brought the gold plates from Mesoamerica up to New York. Same so, distance, right? Same walk and probably a little more frontier. Yeah, but uh, we can account for Joseph Smith's time a little bit better than if all of a sudden there's this huge gap missing while he walks to, what, 3,800 miles yeah, and back. So it's a little bigger than the 100 miles he went to get that first seer stone underneath the tree. Yeah, I almost think here that maybe he's deriding the theory in Marky Petersonian fashion. Yeah. And, and when he says, by the way, that it's ridiculous to have Joseph Smith go all the way down to Central America to get the plates, he's also uh, implicitly acknowledging it's just as ridiculous for Moroni to travel all the way up to Palmyra to bury them. Well, maybe. But then again, you know, he wasn't doing anything else. <laughs> all his family and friends got knocked off at the battle. So he's just hanging out. There's no TV. There's no Internet. There's no movies to go to. Oh, yeah. I like the next line that Marky e. Peterson says. Oh, please read it. Oh, no, you go ahead. Uh, I don't have it in here. Go ahead. Oh, well, it goes on. I do not believe we can be good Latter-day Saints and question the integrity of Joseph Smith. Now, what he's saying that, what he's saying is Joseph Smith identified it as Camorra, where all these battles took place. So now you're questioning his integrity. So did, so did Moroni. What did Moroni do? He also said that this was the Hill Camorra. Right. And he said it to Joseph Smith and apparently he said it to Martin Harris as well. Yeah, Oliver Cowdery, David Whitmer. I mean, they've all got it. Moroni is stopping strangers on the street and telling them that this hill's named Moroni, uh, Camorra. Yeah. And, and same I, thing, by the way. He says, I do not believe we can be good Latter-day Saints and question the testimony of the 11 witnesses of the Book of Mormon. I do not believe you have a testimony of the truth if you question the accuracy of the translation of the Book of Mormon. So he's putting this ge geographical question on a par with questioning the testimony of the eight and the three witnesses and the translation method of the Book of Mormon. He is. Wow. Now, the thing that's interesting here to me is that I had no idea. What's that? Doctrines of Salvation? Yeah, yeah. I Go had ahead. Finish your thought. I just wanted to show the audience a teaser. Because I think we got a big Joseph Fielding Smith quote coming up here. Oh. I had no idea that this theory was a source of such massive controversy in the LDS church in the mid-20th century. I had no idea whatsoever. When I joined the church in 1978... It was part of the common understanding, and I can't tell you where I heard it. All I know is this is my understanding, so I must have gotten it from somewhere, was that the Book of Mormon took place in the entire Western Hemisphere that encompasses all of North and South America because it talks about the land north, the land south, and the narrow neck of land that a Nephite can cross in a day, right? Yeah. In between. So that's what I understood. But then I get back from my mission. I'm immediately immersed in farms material, and I'm understanding that the intelligentsia, of the church these scholars of the church all seem to be presenting a united front at least in farms that no that's not the case actually there's a very limited geography for the book of mormon none of the events in the book of mormon except for the bearing of the plates happened in new york and everything else happened maybe in an area about the size of the state of israel or maybe the state of pennsylvania if you turn it on its head and it's actually located down there in southern mexico and Guatemala in that area. And no longer is the Isthmus of Panama the narrow neck of land because it doesn't work anymore with that theory. Now it's the Isthmus of Tehuantepec, yeah. which is much fatter. It's still an Isthmus, but it's much fatter than the Book of Mormon. And you would have to be a very, very fast Nephite in order to make that distance in one day's journey. Which the Book of Mormon tells us has to be done. Right. And I think uh, that really stretches credulity, at least for me, to think that anybody could cross that. Yeah, you you got it. Um, the Western Hemisphere model I also started off with, and you know, so much of Mormonism we just accept that the Church is telling us the way it is, and the reality is that when we start using our critical thinking skills, the dominant narrative starts to fall apart pretty quickly. Oh, you're muted. Sorry, something else that I found really fascinating, and I once again I don't want to get ahead of your slides was I had always thought that uh, this Hill Camorra, the two Camorra theory, right? That that was intrinsic to the LDS church. And then I find out, well, wait a second. The first people who came up with this theory were not members of the LDS church. 
No, no. And we'll get to that in a moment. But uh, yeah, that's as early as the early 1900s. Yeah, 1901, you found an early reference to that. Okay, we'll get to that. But what we're saying here now, this is 1957. It's General Conference. Marky Peterson, an apostle of Jesus Christ, is registering his opinion about the two Kimura theory. Highly speculative theories about Book of Mormon geography. I do not believe that there were two Hills Camorra, one in Central America and the other one up in New York. So obviously it's a point of controversy in 1957, which he thinks is significant enough to address in general conference. And then he basically says that if you're going to question that, then you're also questioning the integrity of Joseph Smith. And the uh, and the witnesses. Yeah, and I'm not sure where he's going with that, but I certainly understand what he's talking about with Joseph Smith. Because the Heartlanders, I watched a couple of their videos in preparation for this. and. They have very effective, a very effective presentation where they're saying that the scholars, i.e. the farm crew, right? Oh, we have something from Dan Vogel saying the change in geography began with the Reverend Lamb's 1887 book, The Golden Bible. Okay, so that's even 14 years prior to this 1901 reference that you found. Bill, thank you so much, Dan, for pointing that out. Always good to have great scholars on our program. It is. Absolutely. And I'm actually just so honored and flattered that Dan Vogel listens to the show, although I think he probably does it just for entertainment value alone. Um, So thank you so much for that. So we've got that. It's a huge point of controversy. Marky Peterson is addressing it. And the thing that's so fascinating to me is that now, you know, today and for a while now, a little while now, the church has said, hey, um, we don't really take any position on Book of Mormon geography. You guys figure it out yourselves. We're not going to get into that battle. But here they definitely were. Yeah, we'll get to that. There, There is a moment in time where suddenly the, the brakes are put on and a different conversation ensues. But for a long, long time, the only narrative, the dominant narrative unquestioned in Mormon curriculum is that that Hill Cumorah in New York was the hill where the Book of Mormon took place. Yes. All right. Next one is Doctrines of Salvation. By the way, I've got my own copy. This is Doctrines of Salvation by Joseph Fielding Smith. I believe it was edited by Bruce R. McConkie, his son-in-law. Yeah, he compiles all these statements by his father-in-law. And adopts all of them as the gospel truth in his own mind. Basically, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then this is volume three. And when you open up to page 232, you get an entire section of both pages. It starts off with, where is the Hill Cumorah? Talks about how the earth populated populated rapidly, the locale of Camorra, Rama, and Rimpley Ankum, the early brethren locate Camorra in western New York. Uh, Oliver Cowdery places Camorra in uh, western New York, the hill Rama in western New York. Um, Prophet approves Oliver Cowdery's view. By the way, this is Joseph Fielding Smith saying the same thing, which is that messenger and advocate, I think is edited by Joseph Smith, and hence Joseph Smith gave approval for that document. Can I ask you something, Bill? At the bottom of this, this looks like it might have been one of his answers to gospel questions, since it starts with a question, where's the Hill Cumorah? At the end of that excerpt, does it say the source? Um, It gives lots of sources. Conference report, October 1949, Alma 5034, Mormon 229, gives a bunch of scriptures. But I meant where Joseph Fielding Smith gave it. So maybe he gave this in general conference in 1949. I have no idea where the, yeah, that that might be true. Conference report, October 1949, page 89. Uh, If anybody wants to try to go kind of off and find that and put it in the comments, that would be great. But in each one of these sections, again, it's page 232, 233, 234, 235, 236, Prophet approves Oliver Cowdery's views, testimony of David Whitmer to Hill Camorra, again, talks about the visit of Moroni to him, um, glad tidings from Camorra, which we already went over. This is Joseph 11 Smith, pages. Joseph Smith locates Camorra in Western New York. Uh, ancient city of Manti is in Missouri. Heber C. Kimball tells the death of Zelf. It just goes on and on. And the entire thing, impressions at Kimura, he even ends by saying, like, I just felt the spirit and knew it was Kimura. So what you end up with is a lot of pages of Joseph Fielding Smith going, we are definitely drawing a line in the sand here. We are going to hold this position and we're not going anywhere. That hill in New York is the hill Kimura. Can I just look at this first paragraph? Because that's what's really interesting to me. Please. Where he says, within recent years, 
uh, maybe within 1949 or the 1950s. Within recent years, there has arisen among certain students of the Book of Mormon. And he's looking at the farms crew, which hasn't been created yet, but obviously they adopt this theory and run with it. It's almost like a Holland talk to the Maxwell Institute. Huh? <laughs> yeah, there's arisen among certain students of the Book of Mormon. And I'm looking at you, Dan Peterson, and you, John Sorensen, a theory to the effect that within the period covered by the Book of Mormon, the Nephites and Lamanites were confined almost entirely within the borders of the territory comprising Central America and the southern portion of Mexico. It's the same theory as today. The Isthmus of Tehuantepec, he even says it. The Isthmus of Tehuantepec probably being the narrow neck of land spoken of in the Book of Mormon rather than the Isthmus of Panama. So he actually sets out this entire theory, which is exactly the same thing that John Sorensen and Dan Peterson and basically everybody at Farms and now probably some of the apostles as well, lean toward, adopt, promote as being absolutely wrong. Yeah. Yeah. He spends the next several pages absolutely tearing that theory apart and holding his ground that the hill in New York is the right place. Okay. Very good. This is so fascinating to me. Good, good. All right. Next one. This is uh, other pages of that, by the way. And again, if, if people want to go back and freeze it and read those, they can. But there are tons of spots where it is being, where Joseph Fielding Smith is adamant uh, that that is Camorra. Yes. The the next place we're at is there's this quote, and I want to show, I'll pull up the other screen here in just a moment, but you'll see from this quote here, when Joseph got the plates, the angel instructed him to carry them back to the hill Cumorah, which he did. The hill opened and they walked into a cave in which there was a large and spacious room. And there were altogether in this room more plates than probably many wagon loads they were piled up in the corners and along the walls. So I'm going to go right back here to the, the previous one. You know, when, when, when this picture looks like an absurd kind of thing, imagine all the writing on those plates, imagine the weight of that. And when other people speak on this stuff, that's absolutely the image that should be painted in all of our heads as that's going on now. That's one quote. That's Brigham Young recounting from Oliver Cowdery, Journal of Discourses, 17 June, 1877. That sounds like a great and spacious cave. It, it is. Um, let me go here, add to stream. When we did the episode on Miner's Hill, we used some of these quotes. And by the way, can I just put a fine point on this, Bill? Please. W what this vision stems from is the description in the Book of Mormon that you just read, that Mormon hit up all the plates that have been uh, accumulated and written on during the thousand year history of the Nephites. And they're in this huge room, several wagon loads full of this room. And the story has to do with uh, not Oliver Cowdery. He's being quoted or uh, referenced at least by Brigham Young. Brigham Young says he heard this from Oliver Cowdery. There are a bunch of other people who recount similar things. Yeah. This is not Oliver Cowdery saying that I took a trip down to Mesoamerica or Southern Mexico. And then a the hill opened up and I walked in. This is happening in Western New York at the Hill Camorra from which the plates were taken. Yep. And uh, let me make this a little bigger. So when we did the Miner's Hill, we talked about various quotes where they had gone into a cave and some people confused the cave for the Hill Camorra, but it turns out it was actually that Miner's Hill cave that, that these things likely occurred in. But it was only like a mile south of the Hill Camorra, where that cave was. Right. But it's not just the one quote from Brigham Young. I just want to go through and just really quickly, I won't read any of these, but I just want to show you. It was a mile south of Camorra, not 3,800 miles. No, no, no. Right. A mile south. You got okay. it. A uh, little colder weather in the winter. Slight difference. Um, so here you've got number one, two, quote, you've got th uh, three, four, and five. And these are all you quotes got, about the cave. You got it. Number six, plates. number seven. Uh, number eight, number nine, number 10. So you have 10 quotes where people are referencing uh, this idea that early leaders in visionary form or, or in literal form went into a cave and saw all of Mormon's plates, which also leads credence to, again, you could make the argument they're in a vision and they're going into a cave in Central America in vision, but that's not how they're all perceiving it. And it certainly makes much more logical sense that they're being shown the cave where all this stuff was buried to begin with and end with, correct? 
Well, this is like Joseph Smith thinking that he's translating the Egyptian hieroglyphs, but he's really not. It's just a catalyst to receiving a revelation that becomes the book of Abraham. These, uh, these fellows think they're going into the Hill Camorra in Western New York, but actually they're mistaken, all 10 of them. It actually happened in Mesoamerica. So this yeah. is the problem. Oh, by the way, I'm sorry, I didn't get to that point that I was trying to make, which is where the, uh, the Heartlanders have that video. And very effectively, they title it as scholars. And by that, they mean the farm scholars versus the prophets. Mm. And when it comes to talking about what the prophets have said, what the leaders of the church have said regarding Camorra and Western New York being the place where the battles happened, they win that argument hands down. Because the problem is, is that, of course, the farms crew or the people for Mesoamerica that limited geography down there, they have lots of things going in their favor, which is, number one, it would be impossible for it to have happened in Western New York. And there's other reasons for that. Were you going to get into that, Bill? Uh, yeah, yeah. We're going to discuss what stipulations are set out in the Book of Mormon that New York doesn't meet which forces us to relocate it unless we make, again, in the other theory, tons of allowances and conjecture. Right. So the farms crew then has their work cut out for them. And much of their work has to do with trying to work their way around these statements by leaders of the church, including Oliver Cowdery back in 1835, who's writing the letters. And Joseph Smith is the editor of the Messenger and Advocate at the time. Presumably, he knows what the heck Oliver Cowdery's writing. If Oliver Cowdery got it wrong, you would expect Joseph Smith to issue some kind of correction, which never happens, and he's still got nine years left on planet Earth to do that. But that never happens. So these are the difficulties that the Mesoamerican theorists, that limited geography down there, have. And they have a lot of them that they have to work around. And, you know, Joseph Fielding Smith says it unequivocally. And, well, that's just his opinion. He's speaking as a man. You know, he wasn't the president of the church. He wasn't the prophet at the time. I'm sure they have to do a similar thing with Marky e. Peterson. Anybody else who contradicts their theory, they have to do a workaround in order to not make it revelation and therefore binding upon members of the church as a statement of things as they really are. Amen. Well, fellow lazy learners, shall we continue? Absolutely. Let's continue. So the next one is the 98th Annual General Conference. You'll recognize this name from an episode in the past. Anthony W. Ivins, yep. counselor in the First Presidency, gave a conference talk in April 1928. And uh, I just want to note the reason for this. The church had just purchased the property for the Hill Camorra. Oh, fantastic. Right. They, yeah. they, uh, they, they bought it. They've taken good care of it. They put a statue up. They used to have these nice pageants there every year. I think it was called the Hill Camorra pageant. I wonder why they've done away with that. I have no idea. Why hmm. do you think? Well, when you keep changing your ideas on what happens where, the pageants only become um, a an, a entry point, a gateway drug into the messiness. Hmm. Or maybe President Nelson just doesn't like pageants. Maybe. Or the word Mormon. He was having a get off my lawn moment. <laughs> President Ivins gave this talk April 1928. And I, I don't want to read this either, but just note that he's talking about how they built the Hill Camorra how it's of more than ordinary importance. He goes into detail about what all happened on that hill uh, does, soon uh, after the arrival of these people and the establishment upon this continent, Nephi and the son of Lehi. So they talk about making the plates and where they spent their time. And it becomes absolutely demonstrably obvious uh, when you read this conference talk that President Ivins of the First Presidency speaking in general conference absolutely lays out what everyone else in the audience also believes, which is that hill in New York is the Hill Camorra. They talk about buying the hill, and here they're talking about, I did go to the Hill Shim, and I did take up the records. And so anyway, it's just an entire conference talk about everything that happened on that Hill Camorra, including everything that's contained in the Book of Mormon. And here it says in the Hill Camorra, it talks about them gathering together for that final battle, doesn't it? Uh, let's see here. Gathered in all our people in one land of Camorra, Behold, I, Mormon, began to be old. This okay, man so, at this time was past 70 years of age. You know, it used to mean something when a member of the First Presidency gave an address in general conference and it was published to the world by the church. Yeah. These things are hard to find now, by the way. You can't just go on to LDS.org, I'm sorry, churchofjesuschrist.org and find this talk anymore. Nope. They stop at 1970. But us lazy learners, we, we can find things that maybe other people aren't finding. 
This entire episode is a demonstration of your laziness, Bill. Yeah, thank you, my friend. All right. So <laughs> that entire talk happened. Uh, let me add this back up. You can go get that in the 98th annual conference, April 6th, 7th, and 8th of 1928, just after the church built the hill and that monument was put in. Cool little interesting fact, by the way, that monument used to face one direction. And then in order to give it more prominence uh, to the public, they ended up turning the entire monument and facing in a different direction. I don't remember which it started and which it ended, but it was turned uh, after its initial uh, construction and dedication. Really? Yeah, yeah. That Just another lazy learner fact. Wow. Okay, that's interesting. So she included the the text there, but there's several quotes that point again to that hill being the hill. This was a cool thing I found. This was this one took me about two days of constant research to locate. I had reached out to you and other friends and said, "Hey, there's a reference to the messenger," and the reference in the messenger uh, addresses that this is the hill Camorra. But um, I couldn't find this messenger anywhere. And the only thing I could find was there was a, an official church periodical that was sent to the Maori people, uh, a hat tip to Gina Colvin, uh, the Maori people, and it was called the messenger. It only lasted a few years, but its last edition was one month before what I actually needed. And so I couldn't figure out what had happened. So after a bunch of sleuthing and Google searches, and one thing I'm damn good at RFM is if you tell me what to find, I know what keywords to put in and I will find it if it exists. And uh, eventually I got a image of this, but this is the messenger. So that's the, that's the, the left side on your screen is the cover page. The and right by the way, Bill, right under the cover, the messenger where it says that in the fancy writing at the please, top, what does it say? That it says something along the lines, it's an official document says, of the church of jesus christ of latter-day saints i think it says published by the presiding bishopric of the church of jesus christ of latter-day saints salt lake city utah isn't that what it says it's official hey, it's yeah. just the opinion of the presiding bishopric and of course the article that you are pointing us toward by the way did you say what year this was this is let me see if i have it here july 1960 edition number 51 Okay, so that's 1960? 1960, uh, July. So shortly after I'm born. Well, this yeah. is a very important thing. I thought you were going to take us to the article that says that women, wives should not act as uh, ward teachers. No, I wasn't going to do that, but that was another interesting little blip in there that I, I did get to see. Um, okay. If you wait long enough, everything changes, doesn't it? So this is from the presiding bishop, Rick, to the bishops. Yep. And it says, attention called to Book of Mormon maps. Our attention has been brought in the past few weeks to certain Book of Mormon lands maps, which are being offered to church leaders and auxiliary workers by a California organization. They are apparently being distributed free of charge. We wish to refer bishops to the printed matter at the bottom of the map, which contains an inference that there are two rather than one Hills Camorra. By the way, that's where I thought I'll go with it. Uh, and they actually hills mean being, hills being actually, plural. And yes, they actually mean implication, not inference, but go ahead. Okay. One in Mexico. Sorry about that. One in Mexico, as well as one in New York. The church has never accepted this contention. Bishops are requested to make cognizant of this discrepancy those in their wards who might be sending for these maps or using them for instructional purposes. This concept of two Camorras should not be taught as official church doctrine. They are telling all of the church leaders to stand up and to correct anybody using these maps and to make sure it is clear that the church's official position is one hill Camorra. So this goes right along with Joseph Fielding Smith and Marky e. Peterson in the time period, the same time yeah. period. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You got it. Next, I'll let you take over from here, my friend. This is a cool thing because this is where we start to get to a different spot in the church's timeline where something begins to shift and move, but not quite yet. Right. This is a letter from the office of the first presidency, not the presiding bishopric, but the office of the first presidency. It is signed by F. Michael Watson, the secretary to the first presidency. It, it is dated October 16th, 1990. So we're getting much more recent. And this is what happens here is that this guy named Sparks, he lives out in Oklahoma, apparently. 
Good old brother Ronnie. Letter, Ronnie Sparks. Brother, brother Ronnie, yeah. He writes a letter to the first presidency with a question about the Hill Camorra, right? And where is the Hill Camorra? Because obviously there's this huge controversy that brews. He wants to know from the first presidency. He's going right to the horse's mouth and he writes him a letter. And so uh, Michael F. F. Michael Watson responds to it, which I would think he would do after consulting with the first presidency, as opposed to just going off and being rogue and writing whatever he thought in this letter. But he sends the letter together with a copy of the original letter written by Brother Sparks back, not to Brother Sparks, of course, but to Brother Sparks Bishop, because that's how we do things in the church. It's the personal touch. So here's what he says. So this is to it's so it's addressed to Bishop Daryl L. Brooks. I gave that background. So hopefully the language in the letter will make more sense. Dear Bishop Brooks, and you'll see it's there uh, dated, uh, excuse me, sent to Oklahoma City, Oklahoma South Stake. Dear Bishop Brooks, I have this is F. Michael Watson, secretary of the first presidency writing. I have been asked. By whom? Oh, probably by the first presidency. Huh. Huh. obviously the first presidency i have been asked to forward to you for acknowledgement and handling the enclosed copy of a letter to president gordon b hinckley oh okay so he wrote it to gordon b hinckley who was not well was was he in the first presidency at the time he probably was what year he was this 1990s probably ezra taft benson right yeah he's been and in there from the 80s yeah but benson at this point's got dementia and Either Hinckley's in the first presidency or at one time he was added as a fourth counselor, uh, a third counselor, sorry, fourth Under member Spencer of the first Kimball. presidency. Yeah. Under Spencer Kimball. And so, yeah, he's he's definitely in the first presidency. But apparently this letter was directed specifically to Gordon B. Hinckley. And so Gordon B. Hinckley is the one who tells uh, F. Michael Watson here. Uh, I want you to respond to this for me. OK, now that we've ironed out that little detail, uh, I'm sending to you a copy of the original letter. Uh to President Gordon B. Hinckley from Ronnie Sparks of your ward, Brother Sparks inquired about the location of the Hill Cumorah mentioned in the Book of Mormon where the last battle between the Nephites and Lamanites took place. Oh, he's talking about the battle, isn't he? Hmm, let's see what else he says. The church has long maintained, as attested to, by references in the writings of general authorities, that the Hill Cumorah in western New York State is the same as referenced in the Book of Mormon. So he's yeah. basically repeating what Marky e. Peterson has said, what uh, Joseph Fielding Smith has said. He is giving them the church's official's position. Yeah. Then he ends with, the brethren appreciate your assistance in responding to this inquiry, still writing to the Bishop of Ronnie Sparks, and asked that you convey to Brother Sparks their commendation for his gospel study. Sincerely yours, F. Michael Watson. It is signed, Secretary to the First Presidency. Let me ask you, the very first paragraph, who's in charge of this letter? Uh, the First Presidency, or at a minimum, President Hinckley. Okay, and then the last paragraph, who's in charge? Uh, the last paragraph, the brethren. Well, that looks like plural to me. Yeah. So um, I'm guessing at least two of the First Presidency, if not all three. Yeah, but here's the strange thing. This letter is so damning to the Two Hills Camorra theory that what Fair Mormon would like you to believe is that the First Presidency Secretary apparently answered a question according to his own understanding. No revelatory basis exists for this position other than all the shit we've laid out for the last hour in 10 minutes, right? Which also should be a should be dealt with honestly and fairly by Fair Mormon, who is fair, right? They're Fair Mormon. And yet they try to isolate this letter in a vacuum, number one. And number two, they add allowances and conjecture, placing that middle paragraph solely as the view of F. Michael Watson, rather than the first presidency who seems to be in charge of the whole damn letter. Right. Well, the first thing is that now that we've gone through this in some detail, thanks to your excellent research, Bill, we have seen that when F. Michael Watson says this has been the teaching of general authorities for a very long time, he's just stating a fact. We've gone over some of those people, those general authorities who have indeed taught this. Additionally, this letter is very difficult for the limited geographic, uh, limited geography model people, the farms crew, because it's coming from the secretary to the first presidency, 
it has a certain letterhead on it that says the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints Office of the First Presidency, and it's signed by F. Michael Watson. So what to do, what to do? Well, we can't accept it as authoritative, even though it bears all the earmarks and the hallmarks of being an authoritative statement from the First Presidency. No, we're going to nitpick on this, and we're going to say basically that the Secretary was acting in a rogue capacity. And in spite of what common sense would tell us that he's not going to be out there writing stuff uh, without, you know, passing it by the first presidency to make sure that it's okay with them. Right. Um, But also it has to ignore all the language in it that talks about, well, I've been asked by and the brethren asked that we commend this person. And it was sent to Gordon B. Hinckley. So it's obvious that he's not acting on his own, but they have to say, well, it's his own opinion. There's no revelation here, blah, blah, blah. But this is a very, very big thorn in their side. And so they're going to have to find a way around it. All I'm going to say is this, okay? What the apologists do, and I'm looking at you, Dan Peterson, and also William Hamblin, who has since deceased relatively recently in the last year or two. What they ended up doing in order to respond to this letter, which is such a death blow, if taken at face value, to the theory that they have that the Book of Mormon and the Hill Cumorah took place in um, Mesoamerica and Southern Mexico. What they end up doing is perhaps one of the most extraordinary cases of deceit and machinations that LDS apologists have ever been caught red-handed doing. And that is what we are going to be talking about next week. And that will be its own episode. And hopefully, fingers crossed, we'll have a special guest on. But I haven't confirmed that yet to speak. Uh, It's not Dan Peterson who I'm speaking to. But Dan Peterson will probably find out about this. If Dan Peterson wants to come on the show and defend his honor, what there is left of it, then he's welcome to come on the show. So I love it. So next week's episode will start probably with this image as you reiterate what's here going on. And then we'll carry forth from there. I want to pause here for just a moment because this is kind of that that moment where we're going to start to go in a different direction. Um, I want to say to the viewers right now, I hope you're enjoying the program. Uh, if you'll hit the like button in, or the subscribe button or both for that matter on YouTube, if you want to make a donation and help us continue to put out episodes that uh, take this kind of time and effort uh, to find sources Uh, I want to say again, a big thank you to Maven for putting the images together. Everybody should uh, give her a a kudos uh, for for what she did to put this PowerPoint together with these documents and images next to each other. If you guys want to see this continue, please send a few bucks, become a recurring uh, donator. We're off now on 2022, January 5th, and we'd love, RFM, you and I would love to do this for a few more decades and uh, and talk about this kind of stuff and produce Mormon material and... uh, help people to make sense of all of this messiness. Uh, Maven, you've got something? Yes, I do just want to thank the people who have donated in the chat so far. I do try to watch that and say thank you when I see it, Um, but sometimes I miss people, so apologies for that. But thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, guys. We appreciate it. This is how we do it. Uh, Starting uh, January 1st, I went part-time for my main job. You've talked about reducing your workload a little bit, and it's already given me more time to start working on content I just put out an episode for Mormon discussion. I think it's episode 358 or 359. And I hadn't put something out for that for months and months, but we're back to to doing that. So uh, I just want to say thank you to everyone who gives, whether it's a little, whether it's a lot, each of you are meaningful. It all adds up and it's allowing us to continue to put more time and energy into producing good content. Um, Let me also say here at this midway point that we're already an hour and 15 minutes in. This is where it starts to change. I'm going to ask you a question, RFM. Up until this letter, 1990, October 16th, it looks like. Up to this letter, can you find, and I didn't, can you find anything in official church publications, curriculum, general authority quotes, anywhere where anything other than a single hill Camorra in Palmyra, New York is promoted? Oh, you're, you're muted again, my friend. Sorry about that. There are books that have been written, 1981 uh, by David Palmer proposing this, 1984 quite famously, John Sorensen's magnum opus, an ancient American setting for the Book of Mormon. There was an article 
that was written by John Sorensen that was published in the Enzyme in the latter part of 1984 that promoted this idea of two Kimuras. That'll be part of the story we'll get to next week. So there is a little bit of an inroad prior to 1990, but it's but very official small. channels in official uh, channels, except for the Enzyme being an official publication. Was there, Others, you said there was something in the Enzyme prior? 1984. Yes. At the end of 1984. 1984 enzyme. I, I wish I would have known that I would have put that up on the screen and at least acknowledged that. So there's a 1984 enzyme article that mentions two hill Comoras. Yes. Okay. That's I'm intrigued by that. Other than that, then is there any other official? I will tell you that it had to wait till Marky Peterson passed away at the beginning of 1984 for it to be published. Gotcha. Gotcha. We, we, we should include that next week just so viewers can see it. Oh, we'll have it. Okay, perfect. Love it. Awesome. All right. So now let's move into where things begin to change. Um, now I want you to tell us as much as you'd like to say about a missing thing. Do you want to say anything about that? I don't want to say anything about it. This is the perfidy of the farms crew, which will be exposed in all its glorious detail yeah. next week. Yep. There. Yeah. We, yep. I'll, I'll just leave it at that. So if this episode intrigued you at all, and you would like to know how apologists have in, in what RFM described as the most apparent deceitful act in Mormon apologetics, you're going to, I think that's a good tease. I think you're going to want to turn in, tune in next week and check out next week's episode. So we're going to kind of skip this little moment and RFM will explain that to us, but it's the moment where everything changes uh, in definitive ways. Oop, right. Let me get rid of that. Sorry, that was part of the, the other piece. It's okay. okay. It's okay. So, Basically, it's a saga of the second Watson letter, yeah. which almost certainly never existed, even though the farms crew pretended it did and cited it authoritatively in their publications. Yeah, I'd love to see it. Well, uh, so would everybody, but apparently yeah. it's missing, and it has been for... Well, let's see, since 1993, how long is that? That's seven, eight, nine, 29 years? Yeah, almost 30 years, almost three decades. Yeah, it's like Lucy Harris got her hands on this thing. <laughs> oh, boy. Okay, let me uh, kind of finish then wrapping up with a couple of ideas, which is as things shift now and change, because now we live in a church that readily makes a safe space for a two hill Camorra theory. It doesn't really get in the way of the heartlanders or the Mesoamerican setting. It kind of lets those guys all battle it out and it kind of keeps its mouth shut and makes it non-punishable to believe in all possibilities. Right? Right. Okay. The church, which is led by not just one prophet of God, but the direct pipeline to the almighty, but 15 of them, apparently cannot find it amongst themselves to figure out where the heck the Book of Mormon took place. Yep. Yep, absolutely. So you had said this all started to change. You know, I had found the date of 1901 where the reorganized church was beginning to talk about this, currently the community of Christ. And then you had found research that said it was really heavily debated back in the 40s and 50s, correct? Uh, the 20s by them. 20s, sorry. And, so this um, idea started outside the churches, uh, I believe, with the reorganized church. And their leaders are talking about it in their conference in the 1920s, or maybe even in 1901, but in the early part of the 20th century. So let's say that. So it starts infiltrating into the LDS church. Yeah. So when the leaders of the church are combating this, they're not only combating it because they think it's false doctrine, they're also combating it because it's the reorganites who are promoting this. Yeah. So those guys don't have revelation. They're wrong. Don't trust them. We're right. We're the true church. We've got real prophets, real apostles. We've got real priesthood. This is the voice you should trust. Right. They seem to believe, at the time they did believe, can any good thing come out of Missouri? Yeah. Now, there is nothing in the Book of Mormon or in Mormonism that explicitly in any way forces us to relocate to Central America, other than there are data points in the Book of Mormon that the right area has to match. And so I did want to lay this out. So what's on the screen right now is one of two coordinates that uh, the Mesoamerican advocates uh, say is a solid possible site for the Hill Cumorah in the Book of Mormon, 
correct? Uh, I'm taking your word for that particular point, but yes, they do say it's down there. Yeah, and there are two sets of coordinates that they point people to. You mentioned before we started the show, what? What the uh, the two points of, oh yeah, even even the Mesoamericanists, the limited geographic people, uh, they cannot agree amongst themselves. This is how clear cut the geography is in Mesoamerica, that they can't agree amongst themselves as to where it took place. They may have some points in common that basically it's in this area in the Isthmus of Tehuantepec, which is there at the right part of the screen. See how fat that Isthmus is? Yeah, try and get it across that in a day. Yeah. So, but this is where they think that the hill Camorra was, because it has to be north of the narrow neck of land, right? Sort of like it is in Joseph Smith's view as well. It's just a lot further north. But that's where they propose it took place. And by the way, Bill, there's a yeah. couple of reasons uh, that the farms crew and this limited geography, <laughs> limited geography people, they go with this model. There's some good reasons that they're doing this. The yeah. first is there's no artifacts in New York Camorra that would support the battles that the Book of Mormon describes as having taken place there. So they go down here where it's probably, I don't know that they found a whole lot down there either, but at least it's further away and there hasn't been as much research done and it's much further removed. The other thing is that at a minimum, the Book of Mormon civilization must have the technology of writing. Yeah. Because gold plates, right? You it doesn't that, have to be everybody, but they have to be able to write because the Book of Mormon demands it. And what history has shown, which of course has advanced a great deal since 1830, what history has shown that in the Western Hemisphere, in all of North and South America, there was only one civilization that existed during Book of Mormon times. And I hope I'm not getting this wrong. People correct me if I'm incorrect, but I'm pretty sure I am right. That had... The ability to write that had that technology and those were the mayans mm. and this is where they lived in this area mm. so basically that's why they have to go there because the current state of science and archaeology shows it couldn't have happened up there in new york camorra and therefore it must happen somewhere where there was writing so that limits it down here at uh, the Isthmus of Tehuantepec, which is right around where the Mayan civilization was. And X marks the spot. So that's now Camorra. By the way, the Camorra they locate is a much bigger hill than the Drumlin Hill in New York. So uh, it's much more imposing. All right. So you mentioned David Palmer earlier. Uh, I'll mention also, you mentioned John Sorensen, I think. it Sorensen labeled out 15 cultural criteria for the Hill Camorra which were based on contextual clues from the text of the Book of Mormon, Mm -hmm. cities, towers, agriculture, metallurgy, uh, formal formal political states, organized religion, idolatry, crafts, trade, writing, weaponry, astronomy, calendar systems, cement, and wheels. An emphasis on the writing there, by the way. What's that? Emphasis on the writing there, by the way, in that list. Yep. Sorensen alleges, let's see here, let me say this right. Sorensen alleges that the hill in New York at least partly fits four of these requirements, while the coordinates shown on the image on the screen uh, meets all of them at least partially. David Palmer then comes in next, and he lists topographic and geographic criteria for Camorra that has been developed. He says things such as it was near an eastern sea coast. It was near a narrow neck of land. Again, the Book of Mormon says you have to be able to travel that in one day's time. Um, ver, uh, number three, it was on a coastal plain, possibly near other mountains and valleys. It was one day's journey south. We talked about that of a large body of water. It was in an area of many rivers and waters. It was in the presence of fountains. The By the way, fountain means something a little different in this time period. I don't remember what that was, but it was, I think it was any kind of channel of water that emptied into a larger body of water. So if a river emptied into a lake, that was considered a fountain by 1830 terms. Um, just one more fact of lazy learners. It, uh, the abundance of water apparently provided a military advantage. There was an escape route to the land. The hill was large enough to provide a few, to provide, I'm sorry, to provide a view of hundreds of thousands of bodies the hill was apparently a significant landmark. The hill was apparently freestanding, so people could camp around it. The climate was apparently temperate, 
with no record of cold or snow. The hill was located in a volcanic zone susceptible to earthquakes because remember when Christ comes in third Nephi and he shakes the whole place and burns the whole place with fire prior to his coming. It's a nice thing that the Savior Messiah would do before visiting all of his people, um, you know, causing major disaster with uh, men, women, and children. Uh, kind of reminds me of that global flood thing that happened. Yes. Oh, and I know you're in the middle of something, but you're I just good. want to let you know that I looked up fountain in the 1828 Webster's Dictionary. Yeah. Which should reflect the common usage in Joseph Smith's day. Uh, it has a number of things, but basically it's a spring. This is the first definition, a spring or source of water. Yeah. Properly a spring or issuing of water from the earth. So it's like a spring. Yeah. And um, it could also be a small basin of springing water. It could be the head or source of a river. Yeah, see, that's and I think four. that's the way they propose it be used in this in this term. Yes. All right, I'm going to skip actually to something um, because I just I wanted think... to cut in real quick. I just really Please. liked this comment that I put up about the uh, requirements being close but not quite. Okay. Are, why don't you read that for us, Maven? No, I almost think you need meeting to these requirements is like almost making it to the toilet. It doesn't count. Right. Perfect. Love it. Um, I want to bring up here. This is John Clark, 2004, because we're noting all of the stipulations that the Hill Camorra in Palmyra, New York, would have to have in the contextual environment in order to meet uh, the requirements in order to be the hill that's spoken of in the book. John Clark famous scholar in the church, worked with farms and other places and wrote lots of material um, um, years ago, uh, says this, says, in accord with these general observations about New York and Pennsylvania, we come to our principal object, the Hill Camorra. Archaeologically speaking, it is a clean hill. No artifacts, no walls, no trenches, no arrowheads, the area immediately surrounding the hill is similarly clean. Pre-Columbian people did not settle or build here. This is not the place of Mormon's last stand. We must look elsewhere for that hill. I want to note, go, go ahead and share your point. No, I was just going to say, he sets forth one of the major reasons why it is that they have to look elsewhere for the hill Camorra where the battles took place. It regardless of what Oliver Cowdery wrote, regardless of what all the leaders of the church have said for over a hundred years, regardless of this first presidency letter in 1990, regardless of all that, we have to look elsewhere. And we have this interesting spectacle, which has come with full force into my mind of the apologists trying to save the church from itself. Yeah. Just, I want you to say that again, but I want to real quick before you do it, the comment there, will you put the comment that was just on uh, back up, uh, Maven? Just FYI, the armies described in the Book of Mormon were larger than the entire Roman legion, millions killed, but no artifacts, of course. Blame Rust. I just want to note, number one, they do that. The apologists do blame Rust as a reason we don't find artifacts. Yet there are things found all the time, and as you pointed out, RFM, something of this magnitude there would be evidence left behind. There is zero archaeological evidence on this continent that can be directly connected to the Book of Mormon. And I'll go on top of that and say this. Even the church's apologist, Mike Ash being one of them, acknowledges the only way he can make it work is by allowing the authors of the Book of Mormon to be exaggerating in multiple places, including the numbers involved in these battles. Yeah, so really it was just kind of a, a gang fight. It was the Sharks against the Jets on Camorra. Yeah, the Sharks against the Jets. They had a little rugby game. They exaggerated the details. Moroni's really big and Mormon's really big on just getting themselves in the history books. And they named millions of people when it was really like 3,000 versus 2,000. It was 20 guys on each side. <laughs> I, I just want to know here, we're not going to go into this, but one of these days we'll do an episode on it. The, the 2,000 stripling warriors going into a battle against a larger, stronger, more experienced army and not one soul was lost is absurd. On top of that, then you have them uh, having lots of wounds or they were bleeding. None of them get gangrene and die because none of them died. Um, the healthcare back then must have been amazing, you know? 
Mm, yes, it was. Okay. Just another battle where there's absurdities involved. At some point, listeners, if there's a believer listening, put your thinking hat on and go, what's the most rational, logical conclusion based on the number of times that I have to let my critical thinking skills sit by the wayside and I have to go with the less rational answer. I have to make lots of allowances. I have to add in tons of conjecture. And you're not, you have to do it 27 times just in this episode. And, and then you go, well, what about all the other problems? And I'm just telling you guys, sit with it for a little bit. Use your thinking skills and be willing to ask yourself the question, what if it isn't what I was told? What yeah. if it isn't? The, the remarkable thing is that the Nephites, when they went to this battle against the Jaredites, it was the gang fight. They were actually heard to be singing, when you're a Nephite, you're a Nephite all the way from your first cigarette till your last dying day. <laughs> I don't know what that's from either. Well, you can guess though. I, I don't. Don't make me sing this. Uh, you can sing if you'd like to. People love to hear you sing and I think you've got a great voice. Oh, you're too kind. It's a jet. When you're, when you're a jet, you're a jet all the way from your first cigarette till your last dying day. No wonder they lost a lot except for that those couple of Super Bowls with Namath, I think. Yeah, really. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, there's your, your West Side Story reference. Oh, I thought when you said jet, I was thinking you said the Jets against the Sharks or something. I thought maybe we were making a professional sports reference. Their game It names. was West Side Story. Oh my lord! This is Man, I'm embarrassed. I for saw you that now. back in like fifth grade or something. <laughs> okay, well, it's time to see it again. They have a new version out. I hear. I know. I saw that. We're gonna have to go see it. All right, now back to what we were doing here. So, um, where are we gonna go? Let's go to the Encyclopedia of Mormonism, which came out in 1992, by the way, and they have an article written about the subject Kimura. Authored yep. by David Palmer, no less, the one who wrote the 1981 book. Look at that. And the thing I just want to note here, Camorra in the Book of Mormon, the very first sentence there, Camorra in the Book of Mormon refers to a hill and surrounding area where the final battle between the Nephites and Lamanites took place. And then... Um, yes, the but when he says it, he's not talking about New York Camorra. It's no, like no, when Brigham no. Young talks about God. He's not talking about Heavenly Father. He's talking about Adam. When uh, David Palmer talks about the Hill Camorra, he's talking about Mesoamerica or technically Southern Mexico, I think. Yeah, they are completely by by 1992. So the 1990s, that first presidency letter where they are adamant there's one Hill Camorra and only a little more than two years later, we now have an idea that, nope, there are two separate places. Uh, again, the first one, Camorra in the Book of Mormon, refers to a hill and surrounding area where the final battle between the Nephites and Lamanites took place. And then down here in the bottom uh, right, second paragraph from the end, the more common reference to Camorra among Latter-day Saints is to the hill near present-day Palmyra in Manchester, New York, where the plates which the prophet Joseph Smith translated the Book of Mormon were found. Um, now, if so you want to that. find the quote... It's on the next page. This this article concludes on the next page, and it's right there. And by the way, he also cites himself in this, and it says bibliography, John Clark, and then David Palmer, his book In Search of Camorra: New Evidence for the Book of Mormon from Ancient Mexico, published in Bountiful, Utah. Doesn't sound like it's Deseret, 1981. Yeah. So the 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 sentence you're looking for there. Oh, and by the way. The third and final biblio bibliography entry is John L. Sorensen's article, Digging into the Book of Mormon, Part 1, Enzyme, 1984. That's the one I was talking about earlier. Yeah, let's see here. So, because the New York site does not readily fit the Book of Mormon description of Book of Mormon geography, some Latter-day Saints have looked for other possible explanations and locations including Mesoamerica. Does he mention that they've been roundly condemned by former presidents of the church or at least leaders of the church? Like yeah, Joseph, they don't, they, they don't say that. They don't mention, okay. No. Although some have identified possible sites that may seem to fit better, Palmer, quoting himself there, looks like. Yep, exactly. And, and there, are, there are no conclusive connections between the Book of Mormon text and any specific site that has been suggested. That's interesting language, RFM, don't you think? 
Yeah, it sounds like they know it didn't happen in New York, so we have to look elsewhere per John Clark, right? Yeah. But still, it, no place, there's no conclusive connections anywhere in North or South America that they haven't been able to locate. Any of the sites suggested, the hemispheric model, the Heartland model, the two coordinates in Mesoamerica, uh, no, there, see here, there are no conclusive connections between the Book of Mormon text and any specific site that has been suggested. Yes, that's a revealing quote. And if you sit with that for a while, it can become quite disturbing. By the way, this this whole thing about the um, the farms crew, which I, I call them, uh, and the Mesoamerican theory, which is we know it didn't happen in New York in spite of what everybody else has said, these leaders of the church that we are ostensibly members of and ostensibly sustain them as prophet seers and re revelators, but apparently only when they don't contradict their theories. These people, they're looking down there because they can't look in Camorra. Here's the joke. Are you ready for the joke? Please. Guy walks down the street. It's at night. He sees another guy who's under a street lamp. And this guy's on his hands and knees and looking around. It's obvious he's looking for something that he's lost. And so the first guy stops and he says to this guy who's on his hands and knees, says, uh, are you looking for something? He says, yes, I am. What are you looking for? Well, I'm looking for a quarter. Really? Uh, where did you drop it? He said, well, I dropped it down the street a block. And first guy says, well, how come you're looking here? And he says, well, because the light's much better here. <laughs> okay. This uh, is the whole thing in a nutshell to my mind. He, they dropped the quarter up the street. That's where New York is. That's where the Camorra is. That's where all the church leaders say it has been. But they know it's not there. So they're going to look where the light's better, where they think it can fit better with what we know about history and the lack of any archaeology relics or remnants or anything found on the hill Camorra. in the words of john clark it's a clean hill and the surrounding area is clean there are no artifacts anywhere it didn't happen here in new york so yeah. we'll look down in mesoamerica where the light's better i love it yeah there's nothing that uh explicitly pushed anybody to go to central america other than new york completely didn't work and they simply looked around North and South America, which is a lot of places, and found the one or two that they thought fit the um, the context the best and said, that's got to be it now. And right. it, it just seems, it seems disingenuous if, you know, we try to argue that, you know, a certain thing happened in a certain place and everything seems to substantiate that. And then suddenly we take the text seriously. We start to examine it with critically think with critical thinking skills. It absolutely doesn't fit. And so we just take up an entire mass of land that is um, far in, in scope, breadth, width, and decide then at that point that we're just going to move it to a better location with, without any inspiration, no revelation, Nobody explicitly saying you have to do it. It's just because the first place completely fell on its face. Right. Now, there's a couple of things here. First off, I've got to tell you that this is part of the hubris of the apologists who, as ostensibly faithful members of the LDS church, nevertheless believe that they are smarter than the prophets of God who lead their church. And so they have to come in. They have to save the church from the leaders, which is very much a tail wagging the dog kind of scenario. And this is another example, as you pointed out before, of where this church has changed so much since I was baptized in 1978. It used to be that the church knew things and they proclaimed things. And there were certain truth propositions that they were very, very free and firm about proclaiming. This is one of them. Yeah. The leaders of the church used to know for a hundred years where the Hill Camorra was located. And by that, I mean where, where the battles were. And it was in Western New York. And you've given some of those citations. Now, since 1990, the church has moved away from that and they've shrugged their shoulders and they said, don't look at us. We don't know. We're not taking a position on this anymore. And once again, they walk one more issue back to a place where it's indiscernible from an obvious fraud. Yes, exactly. And it's also this idea. I mean, this is one of the surprises to me, the wonderful surprises. The way the church has been pretty much since I've been paying attention is we don't take a position on this. 
But that sort of occludes the huge controversy that existed for decades in the church in which they fought fiercely against this limited geography theory of having it happen in Mesoamerica and Southern Mexico. They don't talk about that. So it was a wonderful surprise to find out that all this had been going on in history because I would never have known it from listening to the church since I've been a member. No, it wasn't in the correlated curriculum. And in fact, you're led to, you're, you're, you're being deceived all the time, even currently. And this is kind of where we'll start to wrap up. Um, I'm going to, the next time you make a comment, RFM, if you can try to make it just a touch longer, I'm going to uh, try to enter the call-in studio and I'll need a minute to do that. But let me at least unveil this and then maybe you can comment on this. But I want to talk for a moment about some of the current stuff that's still on the church's site and how they're being deeply deceptive once you know the history that we've just laid out in the last hour and uh, 40 minutes. Um, this is churchofjesuschrist.org. You can see that at the top. This is their historical sites. This is Hill Camorra. Uh, it says the Hill Camorra in Manchester, New York. Now, see, again, they... If you're a believer and you don't read outside of the correlated curriculum, you're going to struggle to parse out the language. But notice they're pointing specifically to one of the two Hill Camorras. The Hill Camorra in Manchester, New York, is the place where Joseph Smith met annually with the angel Moroni from 1823 to 1827. He obtained the plates. He translates them. You go down here to the bottom, talks about the site. The events took place at the Hill Camorra. By the way, they don't want to tell you which events because they don't want you to discern that some of the events didn't take place at this hill, so they just leave it open. The events that took place at the Hill Camorra were foundational to the establishment of the Church of Jesus Christ, Latter-day Saints. Um, Joseph, or directed by an angel Moroni, Joseph Smith found the gold plates deposited on the hill. Joseph met an angel on the same day. Uh, from those plates, he later translated the Book of Mormon by the gift and power of God. Look at this. In the 1820s, the hill did not have a name. It later became known as the Hill Camorra because Moroni, the Book of Mormon's final author and angel who met with Joseph Smith, wrote that he had hidden the gold plates in a hill called Camorra. Let me start off by saying that's not correct. They're quoting Mormon 6.6. 6. It's actually Mormon in Mormon 6.6 because 6 we used that scripture earlier. It's Mormon who's talking. And he buries the majority of the plates in the Hill Camorra in whatever location it is, and then gives the small set of plates that makes up the Book of Mormon to Moroni. In this paragraph, they are making it sound as though it's more it's Moroni who's bearing the plates, and that's how we know it from Mormon 6:6. 6, 6. That's not true. Number one. Number two, to claim the hill did not have a name when in multiple sources the early leaders of the church claim Moroni himself told them that was the name of the hill, is disingenuous. The hill did have a name. Moroni called it Camorra. You're, you're muted. I have been winnowing my Book of Mormon as you've been talking. I agree with you as to one of your parts, but I do want to correct that um, Mormon 6.6, 6, though it is a long verse, does end with, um, it came to pass that when we had gathered in all our people, I, Mormon, began to be old. I made this record out of the plates of Nephi, hid up in the hill Camorra. All the records which had been entrusted to me by the hand of the Lord, save it were those few plates which I gave unto my son Moroni. So I guess I won't push back against it. You're absolutely correct. Yeah. It so does talk about Mormon hiding them so, up in the hill. Yeah. So if you're the Strengthening Church Members Committee, as an apostate, I'd like to ask you to rewrite this because it's factually not true. You're pointing to a scripture and you're saying that this scripture tells us that Moroni buried the plates in the Hill Camorra, and what it actually says is that Mormon buried other plates in a hill called Camorra, and it has nothing to do with Mer where Moroni buried them. So right. I know they're listening. If we are about honesty, in the next week or so, we should see a, a significant change to this paragraph, and it'll be interesting if people pay attention. Second, I think you need to make a second change. You need to honor that in multiple sources, Moroni himself says that hill in New York is named Camorra. So to say the hill did not have a name and it only later became known as the hill Camorra because of the history that happened in uh, 1827 is disingenuous to what happened before. Are you? Do you agree with both those points? 
Actually, I do, because I believe that those uh, those stories like that were told by Martin Harris that you mentioned yeah. would have been taking place during the translation period. They would have been in the 1820s, and they got the name Camorra from the angel or the old man on the side of the road. Take your pick. Yeah. By the way, there was one reference. I can't remember where it was. I should have saved it because it would be hilarious to the audience. There's one place where a witness is talking about the hill Camorra, Camorra and he spells Camorra, Camoros, uh, just like Captain Kidd in the area that his books were written about in terms of geography, which indicates to me that at least that story is in the milieu of the people who were talking about the hill Camorra and trying to figure out where Mormonism is originating from. I think that's just the Camoros is just the Greek version of the Hebrew Camorra. Uh, yeah, probably. Yeah, probably Hebrew. I said that for the backyard professor. <laughs> All right. A couple little last things and we'll move on. And by the way, I'm looking at my final conclusion and uh, I'm going to read a poem. But just before that, I'm going to quote Dan Vogel. So if Dan's still watching, uh, this will be kind of exciting uh, as a little fanboy for me to for me to quote him as he's watching the show. Um this is the Hill Camorra photo. Uh, just a note here. Uh, Camorra is the hill and area recorded in the Book of Mormon where the Nephites and Lamanites fought a final battle. So it's also saying that, by the way, I think it says the same thing. I just want to look here. It's kind of small. Um, in our era, the Hill Camorra is a drumlin hill between the towns of Palmyra and Manchester, New York where the gold plates of the Book of Mormon deposited by an ancient religious leader in a stone box was unearthed. So in that, they're also kind of parsing it out, but they do it with language that would make it really hard for anybody who doesn't understand this whole dilemma to kind of figure that out on their own. And then uh, there's another picture of the Hill Camorra. And uh, I wanted to show this too. I think when it's all said and done, um, it becomes obvious that Joseph Smith intended for the readers of the Book of Mormon to understand his geography in his backyard in that hill as the geography and hill of the Book of Mormon. Do, do you agree with that? I am not sure that I know the subject well enough to come to a decided opinion one way or the other, but I think that this map would be offensive to people living in Michigan. When I was in Ohio, you know what they said about how to find Michigan? No. No, you went west until you smelled it and north until you stepped in it. <laughs> uh, I apologize on behalf of Bill Real to all our listeners in Michigan. The reason I'm saying that is because on this particular map, which is obviously a heartland type of map, uh, the state of Michigan is marked as the land desolation. Gotcha. Um, I'm going to go into hosting the show here in a second. Do you, you have any thoughts, anything that's kind of coming up for you as we've gone over all this material? And then I'll, I'll end with a conclusion and put the, the call banner up. No, if you want to end with your conclusion now, that would be great. I'd love to get some phone calls in. Perfect. Perfect. Um, let me finish then with, uh, that's the end of Maven's PowerPoint. Let me put up a couple little things here. That was Mormon six, six, which we just talked about. Uh, Camorra Hill. This is just one other spot. This is when you go into, I think, the study scriptures. This might be like the topical guide in our scriptures. When you look up Hill, one paragraph is dedicated to uh, the Camorra in New York, and that being the place where Joseph got the plates. And then when you go down a little bit, it's Camorra was in the land of many waters. Mormon hid the records. Uh, again, a reader studying the scriptures would have no way to separate those two things those two locations, and even consider that they might be separate places. And uh, Dan, I actually have in my notes the, the fact that you shared earlier, I forgot that I had it in here, but if you can see there, Dan Vogel, I mentioned that Reverend Lamb in his 1887 book, uh, who wrote about the absurdity of distances and rapid population growth in the Book of Mormon, despite apologetic attempts to invent a limited geography, Panama remains the only narrow neck that fits the Book of Mormon's description. So they have to put it there. In other words, it failed. It doesn't work. It doesn't hold up. And so you find one other spot on planet Earth where you're like, hey, this is close. We're just going to put all our apples, all our eggs in that basket. Yep. Right? 
All right. Let me. Uh, you have to do some work while I tap dance. Yeah, well, can you can you talk on anything for a moment just to buy me two sure. seconds? Absolutely. I can buy. We did words. have a request for RFM to both sing and dance earlier um, when he was singing. Yeah. From West Side that, Story. I did sing, but, uh, you know, I'll do the the here's my dancing for tonight. OK. West Side Story fans will get that, too. Now. Here's the deal, because once again, uh, people look at this and they say, well, how could Joseph Smith possibly have thought that this happened throughout South America and North America? Uh, it beggars description that it could possibly be something like that. Well, I've told the story once before. I'm going to tell it again, because there comes a, it's a maturing process that one goes through. When I was um, about 12 years old, I had gone to Disneyland for the first time. I was captivated by the Haunted Mansion, which I loved and went through a number of times. I thought it was fantastic. And that Halloween, I wanted to do a Haunted Mansion at the local clubhouse at the apartments where I lived at the time. So this uh, clubhouse, of course, is relatively small. But I sat down and I drew a map of the clubhouse. And then I started dividing the clubhouse up into these different rooms. And strangely enough, they kind of uh, sounded a lot like the ones they had at the Haunted Mansion. Oh, here's the ballroom, and here's the seance room, and here's this room, and here's that room, and all these things. I was doing great. I had doors going from one to the other. And by the time I get done, I've got the most incredible Haunted Mansion going on in the apartment clubhouse. The only problem was is that when I took that, which seemed very feasible to me on paper, and I went over to the clubhouse and looked at it, I started seeing that I had misunderstood the dimensions of the clubhouse to the point where each of my rooms was maybe two feet by two feet square because I had got so many rooms in there. So in other words, this is something that I've experienced. I'm not saying this is what happened with Joseph Smith, but it certainly makes it more understandable to me that a relatively young age, he's looking at these massive areas, but treating them as if they're much smaller and that much more can happen within them. So I don't particularly find it convincing to argue, well, Joseph Smith could not have meant all of South and North America because it's obvious that that wouldn't work. I think it's very conceivable that that would have worked in his mind because he wasn't looking at all the different problems that it raises, such as the, um, well, the problem with Nephites getting here, 600 BC, small group, and then multiplying and replenishing like nobody's business to the point where they fill all of North and South America in spite of the fact they have these regular wars where they keep getting decimated, if not more so, from their population. Oh, I see this picture. I've never been to that. That's the Hill Cumora pageant, isn't it? Yeah, I've been there a few times, and it is obvious from that pageant that they want you to understand that that entire narrative took place in this in this geography. Yeah, that's a beautiful, beautiful pageant. Yeah. I understand it's pretty hot there in the summer. Yeah, you don't have to worry about that anymore. Oh, and Dan Vogel tells us that the mound builder myth is hemispheric. Hmm. Mm. Interesting. Um, we're about to enter our victory for Satan segment. Uh, you see the number there down below, 662 Mormons or 662-667, Mark of the Beast, and a seven at the end, 6667. Um, so 662 Mormons with an S on the end, and you'll get in. Maven will put uh, put all that up in the, she'll kind of screen those calls and put those through. We did come up with a new policy, RFM, you and I, this uh, week talking behind the scenes. We were running it by Maven, making sure we're all on the same page. But we we want to make room for uh, more callers to be able to reach us and to get through. And uh, we can only take a few calls kind of at the end of the show. So we're implementing a one phone call per month policy. And so if you will please help us respect that, our screening program also kind of helps us uh, police that a little bit. And we'll try to give some some uh, airway uh, to uh, other listeners and uh, to participate and to talk on the program. Again, uh, click the like or subscribe button. I wanted to finish off tonight's show by reading a poem. And then hopefully we've got a phone call or two in the queue at that point and we can take some phone calls. And uh, this is also on the church's website. This is a poem titled Moroni. And it is by Donald W. Hunter. And it reads like this, RFM. What rhymes with Moroni? Let's see. Uh, we'll find out. I don't think anything. The stone now rests in place, its edges carefully concealed in turf. 
As if unturned since Rama times, when first this hill heard battle cries, first felt the heavy marching feet of armed and angry men who fought like giants one week's war till only one survived, his headless foe beneath his fainting feet. Why must men hurtle here in hate, eager to find a foretold fate on Kimura? The records in place, hidden in the cave below, and in them all the cave below. Work. I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I like all it. our work, our lives, from towered Babel, walled Jerusalem, we came led by the same hand through desert sand and overseas until fulfilling forecast destinies, we found Kimura. That's it. That's beautiful. I'm still I'm still back at the part wondering why uh his feet were fainting. Yeah, I don't I don't know. I can't get past that. Sometimes uh poetry suffers for alliteration. Yes. There yeah, I, I want to come up with a way to say there was a bad poet who didn't know it. Um <laughs> My feet do a lot of things, but feigning isn't one of them. Yeah. So anyway, thanks to the LDS Church for the images that you encouraged us to use. We were really thrilled about those. And uh, I'm just tickled pink about, you know, going through all of this. It seems obvious. 1990, I'll even say 91, 1991 and prior, we, as you pointed out, there's one official reference in the church that makes space for two Camoras. Everywhere else from the foundations of the church, including Moroni himself seems to indicate that that hill in Palmyra, New York is the same hill in the book of Mormon. And I think all of us are going to have to wrestle with this kind of stuff, aren't we? Yeah, I think so. And by the way, just to put the cap on it, uh, this is not the biggest hill in the history of the world. It's actually kind of small church bought it. They've been over it with a fine tooth comb. My understanding is, is that they have never found even the stone box, which everybody agrees the plates were in and were retrieved from. Yeah. It's a clean hill. As John Clark said, um, the church is essentially acknowledging the, the same thing. They also say it's a drumlin hill. That's the word they use. Mm -hmm. And a drumlin hill is just a small hill. It's not really anything special. Yeah. We have um, them up here where I live. It's created by glaciers. Gotcha. Yeah. So everything else is flat except where they have these um, uh, flaws at the bottom of the glacier. Of course, this yep. is happening over hundreds and thousands of years, but as the glacier moves through, it makes everything go completely flat, except for the place where they have the flaws, and there Earth remains. So that's why it's sort of one directional. It's a hill that looks like it has a direction to it, and it's not that big, and it's smooth. Hmm. Good, good stuff. I know there's a caller in the queue. Maven, is, is, is that caller ready, or are you talking to them right now, probably? I, if you don't say anything, I assume that's what's going on. Um, she's putting other pictures up too, which I think are interesting. I thought that one was like a clay figure, but I think this is part of that reenactment. Um, so kind of cool stuff that uh, the church did to put some images together to have Mormon and Moroni and Joseph Smith all interacting with uh, the geography around the Hill Camorra, including the hill itself. Is that supposed to be Moroni? I have, I think so. I think that's a younger Moroni. Well, I don't know. I mean, look at his arms. He's almost got Arnold Freiberg arms. He, he and does. Betty Davis we, eyes. We just got a couple of Arnold uh, Freiberg paintings into our shop at the pawn shop. Oh, one of them was a piece he did on George Washington, and the other one was on mm -hmm. um, at Valley Forge. No, no, it was a football. Yeah, that one. But then there was one on a football game, and George it was Washington two playing football. No, no, it was two college football teams playing against each other and they were man these guys were on steroids i mean it was yes they were muscled men he is definitely famous for making everybody in peak physical condition yes moroni he's got okay he's he's got arnold freiburg arms yeah um it looks like we've got a caller it's nikki i'm gonna put nikki on nikki i'm hoping you can hear us and we hear you I can hear you guys just fine. Perfect, my friend. You're on Mormonism Live with Radio Free Mormon and Bill Real. What are your thoughts on the Two Hills Camorra theory? Wow, it's always uh, amazed me to watch the church kind of bounce back and forth between the the New York theory, North Hemisphere versus the, the Central America one, uh, how they've kind of gravitated between the two regions. And I also found it interesting just 
with the size of these battles, as first stated in the Book of Mormon, there's not one sword, one flint, not one thing. Nope, nobody dropped anything in these battles. No chariots, but no horses. More, yeah, no, no battle papers. Um, battle it's tape. just amazing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, yeah. you're right. Can you hear me? Is that maybe? Yes, I, I can hear you just fine. Yeah, and I hear what you're saying because more and more church art in the last, well, even decades now, if you've got a picture of Jesus showing up to the Nephites and the kids gathering around, you've got like um, a huge monument, um, pyramid, the Pyramid of the Sun, I think, in the background, and the kids are all dressed like little Mayan kids. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the things I think you're talking about where the church embraces to a certain degree that kind of scenario in its artwork. Maybe it's just rogue artists again, like the ones, you know, depicting Joseph Smith translating the Book of Mormon. Those rogue but artists. But it's pretty obvious that the church yeah. is definitely embracing that as a valid theory at a minimum through their artwork. Yeah. Uh, it's funny you mentioned the artwork because when I was at BYU a, a million years ago, uh, give or take a day, I did one of my Utah term papers on the church artwork, how the artwork was portrayed versus the reality. And, you know, and they, you know, they show these big, massive guys and, you know, they all look like something out of a Nordic Viking ad. Mm. But, you know, really, there's just these little little guys, supposedly. Uh, I always thought that was, that was one of the first uh, cracking points, I suppose, in my faith was just to see how the church portrayed it versus uh, the actual history uh, in air quotes. <laughs> Nikki, what grade did you get on that paper? Oh boy, that was a long time ago. I, I don't remember. I wish I, I really wish I saved it, but that didn't. That didn't last. That was like we're talking thirty years ago. So. Awesome. Thank you, Nikki. Thank you for the call tonight, my friend. Oh, thank you. It's been very uh, interesting to listen to this. Perfect. Yeah. Have a thank great you. night. Yeah, um, artwork and, and even the, the videos that the, the films the church makes when they're depicting that kind of stuff. Yeah. I so, think it's almost largely, if not completely, Mesoamerican when they're talking about Nephite stuff going on. One of the comments, there's a Richard in the comments who's saying, I can't help but conclude there was no Hill Kimura. <laughs> Rather than one or two, it seems as though the most rational, logical decision would be maybe there's no Hills, Hills Kimura. Um, I got a question for you, RFM. Again, there has to be one day's travel across the narrow neck of land. Yeah. Uh, we know that humans aren't super fast. I forget what top speed is of a human, but humans do. One of the cool skills that humans have is they can run at their near top speed for longer periods of time than they most can? animals. Oh, do you okay. know how fast tapers run? Do we have any idea if, if somebody got on the back of a taper, if, uh, if they took off and just really, you know, really took that animal hard, if they could cover more or less ground in a day? Um, I think it talks about, it doesn't talk about tapers. I don't think it talks about them actually riding anything. They're actually... Do you, I'll try and find the reference, okay, if anybody else knows it. I mean, even if this Nephite was Usain Bolt, okay, the fastest man alive, <laughs> he cannot make it across the Isthmus of Tehuantepec in a freaking day. Yeah, no, he can't do that. Um, and I'm by the way, think off, yeah, yeah, no, no we're sweat. not talking I'm... about a highway or a track being built from coast to coast across the Isthmus of Tehuantepec. There were a few other things that you'd have to get around and through on your journey like jungles yeah like jungles look at there there is a lamanite going after moroni because he's the last of his kind and there he is hiding behind the tree and he's holding something i can't tell what's in the other hand but he's got a, a metal sword look at that it's an elvish blade it's glowing blue because the lamanite is near that yeah. looks like aragorn and it looks like he's about to take on one of the fighting uru kai of saruman doesn't it seem, first off, notice the color of that Lamanite. He's dark. I, I don't know what that's a reference to either. It's okay. It's okay. Go ahead. The, the Lamanite there is still a dark-skinned Lamanite. Now, he has paint around his eyes, but the yeah. rest of him is just dark skin. He isn't white and delightsome yet. 
And I also found it odd that the church put a metal sword in his hand when really Book of Mormon archaeology really depends heavily on wooden instruments that would have decayed faster. Yes, which are inlaid with sharp obsidian bits. It was a mahu eedle, not a short English sword. You said there's no record of uh, anybody in the Book of Mormon riding a horse, a.k.a. taper, but there's also no record of anybody riding a chariot in the Book of Mormon either, is there? Well, no. And so (laughs) this is very important. You know, chariots are mentioned, but uh, yeah, we know what the apologists do with that, right? Yeah, Some kind of sled, because there's no wheel. So it's come kind of sled. It's not necessarily pulled by a horse because the horses really were tapers. Anyway, it gets into its own separate little uh, chaotic thing. It's, I'm trying to when, look up Day's Journey for a Nephite. When you dig into Mormonism, it's all just conjecture and allowances, isn't it? Oh, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's special pleading all the way. By the way, I think that we might have mischaracterized something. It was not a day's journey for a Nephite. It was a day and a half's journey. A day and a half. So you get a whole, what, 36 hours to to tackle that. Well, back then the days were longer. Yeah. I, I'm just curious how far a reasonable human could, yeah, could travel in 36 hours and how far uh, a taper could travel in 36 hours. Yeah. I, I hear what you're saying. Well, I, all I know is that taper goes a darn sight faster than a sloth. Not by much. <laughs> it's those short. It's those short little legs. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Here it is. It's Alma chapter twenty-two, verse thirty-two. Here's the quote: "It was only the distance of a day and a half's journey for a Nephite on the line bountiful and the land desolation from the east to the west sea." So a day and a half's journey back then. You know they had different reckonings, and a day was actually more like a week. So really, this gives them around 10 days to make the trip, which is definitely doable. Yeah, and uh, Vogel just spoke up there in the comments and said it was 120 miles across uh, the peninsula in Mesoamerica. So that's that's a pretty hard run. It is. I mean, I could do that. Back when I was running cross country, easy. Not so much now. Yeah. All right. Uh, we're going to go to Gary. Gary, you're on Mormonism Live with Bill Real and RFM. Uh, what are your thoughts on the Two Hills Camorra theory? Hey, guys. Yeah, I'm, I actually um, host the uh, channel Topic Discuss. I don't know, Bill, if you remember, I interviewed um, Rami Umpton Ruminations. Rumination yeah, Rami Umpton. yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so... I, and I actually, RFM, I, I'm a big fan of, of you. Not, not no offense, Bill, but RFM, um, I look forward, I hope to get the opportunity to meet you when you are here in St. George on Sunday. That would be great. I like you already. <laughs> and, no, and no offense taken. <laughs> well, I, <clears throat> okay, well, well, it's just because, I mean, you know, he's traveling all the way. To our our town here, so, I, so I'm not quite where you're at, Bill. I'm in I'm in St. George, but uh, you know what, what was interesting for me was just this the whole topic. I uh, went on my mission to West Virginia, but part of that part of my mission was in Ohio and in Virginia. And when I was in Lynchburg, the apartment we stayed in was in the basement of a bookstore owned by members. George and Sylvia Gibbons. I don't. I don't know if they have a, a relation to Carol Gibbons, but they were Mormon historian nuts. I mean, they they really taught me a lot about Mormon history that I had never heard of before growing up in Utah. And one thing that they were really adamant about, and uh, it is the fact that you know the Kilcomora and the mound builder myth really, really was where the Nephites and Lamanites were at and that was so stunning for me as an Utah Mormon because my parents had gone in the eighties to, you know, Mexico and seen these ruins and they came back and told us that they saw depictions of Jesus, you know, descending on the Mayan ruins and that that was where the Book of Mormon was. So I was always taught that, not just by the church, but by my parents. And every member that we ever met in that part of the country that had family history of Mormons who never went to Utah, right? So they, then they were very proud of the fact that they stayed in the East or in the South. They didn't go on the great trek 
few times they kind of held down the fort and they all rejected um they all rejected the idea of mesoamerica uh that uh you know origin or, or location they always went back to the mound builder myth and it it's pervasive uh, and you you probably know that bill just by i think you said you've lived in ohio but the, the whole mound builder myth is pervasive in that area. So I just thought that was, that was an interesting kind of experience with um, kind of a, a, a schism in Mormon culture. Awesome. Thank you, Gary. Yes, thank you. And I looked up George and Sylvia Givens. Uh, it is the same spelling of the last name. I'm not sure about any relation, but it does appear that at least George Givens wrote a book called 500 Little Known Facts in Mormon History. And then that was so popular, he wrote a sequel called 500 More Little Known Facts in Mormon History, maybe uh, 500 Little Known Facts About Nauvoo. It appears to be a popular title, but it does suggest that they um, knew quite a bit about Mormon history. Yeah, we've got our last caller for the night. This will be John. Uh, John, you are on Mormonism Live with Bill Reel and RFM. Uh, what are your thoughts on Kimora? Well, I wanted to share that um, when I was in BYU, I had the hubris to think with all these competing ideas of, hey, maybe it's up in the Great Lakes. Maybe it's down in Panama. Maybe it's all these places. And I was like, well, all I got to do is read the Book of Mormon and just get everything straight from there. <laughs> so I went through and marked every single geographical reference and drew out my own little hand drawing, which ended up being pretty much nothing more than a little hourglass. Mm -hmm. um, but the, um, the thing that stood out, of course, is that nothing really particularly fits it. Um, not even any of the stuff down in South America. It just doesn't really exactly fit. Um, and, of course, my um, believing mind was like, this is clearly the calamity that changed when Jesus came. And I feel like that is a really, really common um, excuse, a really common reason people give for saying, hey, it still could have worked because the whole face of the land was changed when Jesus died. And so that's how it all fits. Um, personally, more, I feel like... Yeah, more allowances our, and more conjecture, oh, huh? Yeah, and just basically anything you can use to say, well, everything that was said doesn't actually apply to this. That's why it still counts. Um, but it, with how extensive our geographical record is, um, we have every spot where major earthquakes have happened, major rifts. Mm, yeah. That just can't be the case either. It's like there would be scars on the land for a calamity like that. Um it would have and to be if so you have more thoughts than that. Yeah, it would have sorry, to be so ahead. it would have to be so massive that we would know about it through scientific means. I mean, this is ridiculously massive, but you're right. I've heard that used as an excuse. Maven makes the comment that she also used to think this about the the huge disruption and calamities in the land that were caused when ne uh Nephi when Jesus visited the Nephites is recorded in 3rd Nephi. But uh, but Maven mentions but you know by the time Moroni was around in writing that was 400 years later um one thing i want to say here <laughs> That's a good I, point. it is a very good point and i think that my recollection is is that there's a passage in alma which appears to be inserted into the narrative from which almost all the geographical clues are taken not all of them but there's a whole it's like 10 verses long and it's like all of a sudden mormon interposes himself in the narrative that he's abridging to give us a geography lesson and Mormon as well lived well after Jesus visited the Nephites. So any geography that he's describing in the book of Mormon should not have been affected by any disruptions in the land caused by Jesus's visit, even if they were huge. All Did right. Yeah. Yeah. No, no. I was just trying to find the mute button and find my cursor on it. So, um, I wrapped up the phone calls. Yeah, that makes sense. It, th this to me, it, just like every other issue we have covered in the next hundred, we will, um, there's problems. And when you deal with those problems, honestly, 
The only way to maintain faith is to take a less reasonable, less logical solution, and you have to do it once again here. Um, it reminds me, I, I think there is a way to do it, but I think you have to adopt the perspective of Kerry Molstein. And so I wondered if we could finish with how he approaches things, because I think it'll help those who are believers listening to our program tonight, and they want to maintain faith. And I thought we would end on that, if that's okay with you. I have no idea what you're talking about. Oh, right, is this a comment that he made? Yeah, yeah. Here, here's the way for those who believe the Book of Mormon is its historicity and that there was a Hill Cumorah, and regardless of where you think it was located, and you want to take this issue and all the others and keep it all together so that you can keep going in faith, here's the way you do it. And so I start out with an assumption that the Book of Abraham and the Book of Mormon and anything else, <clears throat> excuse me, that we get from uh, the restored gospel is true. Therefore, any evidence I find, I will try and fit into that paradigm. I don't feel that I need to defend that paradigm. I feel that I want to understand the evidence that I find within that paradigm because to me it's a given that it's true. There are others who will assume that it's not true, and on these points we'll just have to agree to disagree, but we will understand one another better when we understand how our beginning assumptions uh, color the way we, we filter all of the evidence that we find. Have a great night, RFM. Thanks, Bill. Talk to you later.